Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Iowa Easy Air Air Construction Permit Application Training. I know some of you may have already been uh, to the earlier session this morning um, where Kevin Conley led that session and hopefully uh, helped everyone out in terms of understanding how to set up your account and make associations with facilities and other users. Uh, today, we're going to cover how to submit air construction permit applications, how to uh, rescind those applications, withdraw applications if you need to, submit the startup notifications, startup construction, startup operation. Uh, so I'm Daniel Zulik. I'm an environmental engineer in the uh, air construction permit section, and I'm also the uh, current project manager for Iowa Easy Air. Uh, with me, I have John Curtin, another environmental engineer in our air construction permit uh, section. And we're going to walk you through all of the um, steps, mainly to submit an application and, and modify a permit in the system. Uh, so before uh, John gets into the training here, I'd like to cover uh, some brief updates on Iowa Easy Air. So we launched Iowa Easy Air in uh, December of 2019. So the system has been live for, for several years now, uh, and we've fine tuned the system uh, even after we went live. Last year, we made several major enhancements to the system. Uh, we made uh, just a quick list here, uh, which John and I will cover in depth throughout the training as well. Uh, we added a timeout pop-up box alerting users, um, letting them know that they're about to get timed out of the system and kicked out of the system. We added plant, a plant name field on the template applications. So you could enter a specific plant name for uh, if you have an if you have multiple concrete batch plants or aggregate processing plants, you can now individually name each of those plants. We added a copy emission units button on those template applications. So if you have one of those sources and you have, let's say 10 conveyors, now you can just copy those emission units on the emission equipment list table within the application. Uh, you would just need to modify the EU ID for each of those uh, individual units. We added a button to download all of the application PDF forms in one document. Before you would have to download each individual form. So within a construction permit application, you would have to download the FI form, the CP form, the EU form, and so on. Now you have the option to just press the download all forms button, and it'll give you one PDF file with all the forms combined. Additionally, we added a copy calculations button on the emission calculations form. So if you have several units that have similar calculations, um, when you're calculating the PT for those units, you can just select a unit, click the copy calculations button, and then select the, uh, the, the other unit that has the same calculations. So that should save you quite a bit of time. Additionally, we added a feature in the system where if you want to, you can copy the calculations from the emission calculation form uh, to the emission inventory form. So if you fill out calculations for an emission source in the emission calculation form, and you calculate the annual PTE. When you go to the emission, emission inventory form and you select that emission point from the dropdown list, it's gonna automatically populate the annual PTE you calculated on the emission calculation form. Additionally, we added a new feature uh, to pre-populate the emission inventory form with the emission inventory from the latest application submitted for that facility. So this allows you, uh, this gives you the opportunity to keep a rolling emission inventory form within the system for your applications. And then finally, on your project dashboard, we added a project and EIQ number field or column for any applications that are unfinished or have amendments where there's an actual EIQ number for Title V applications or a project number for construction permit applications. Additionally, for the startup reports, if you've used the system before, you know 
that there's a section on your on your dashboard where um, you you fill out your upcoming submittals and it'll say upcoming submittal obligations and then have a list of all the startup reports that you're required to submit based on the permits issued in the system. We now have a column or two columns in that um, table, uh, one for the permit number and then another for the emission point ID. So you can find the actual permits a lot easier uh, instead of just trying to guess you know, which report is tied to which permit. Okay, so I think uh, the other main change that's kind of not within the system, but is uh, but happened with our rulemaking, is that last year um, we passed some rules requiring an electronic submission of all air construction permit applications and uh, emission inventories. So you're required to submit whether you're a major or minor source. You're required to submit um, your emission inventories in slice electronically, uh, and then for air construction permits, so air construction permit applications and Title V applications have to be submitted within Iowa Easy Air. And then the startup notifications, the startup, uh, startup construction and startup operation notices have to be submitted in Iowa Easy Air as well. So if you have any questions about that, just let us know. And if you have any questions throughout the training about any um, anything that we're covering, uh, if you want some clarification on something, just let us know. Uh, in the chat, and we'll try and answer those questions. Uh, we have Jason Dowie from the Iowa Easy Air Help Desk, who's running the, the chat and the, the Zoom meeting here. So he'll be able to answer a lot of those questions, and then we can also uh, we can also answer those questions when we have some time as well. Okay, so John, if you want to get into uh, submitting an air construction permit application. So today we're going to show you how to uh, apply for a construction permit application in Easy Air. And uh, we're going to spend a good part of the uh, training uh, doing that. We're going to go to about three o'clock here, and then we'll take a ten-minute break. Like uh, Daniel said, if you if you have any questions as we're going through it, we can certainly um, uh, stop and answer your questions. So just send them in through the chat. Um, before I get into the training in Easy Air, I want to show you some uh, places on our website. Uh, where you can access information that's going to help you uh, with your application. Um, the first thing, though, I want to show you is I want to give you um, some information here about how you can contact us um, after today when you go home or to your office and, and maybe in a week or six months from now, you actually got to start using Easy Air. Uh, we support Easy Air uh, in a lot of ways, and a lot of times questions come in and they fall into two, two, di two distinct groups. Um, there's questions about the Easy Air system, and this would be like things like registration, um, maybe some trouble with uh, assigning preparers or consultants, submittal issues. Sometimes there's questions or there's trouble with... Um, fees at the end of the process. So if you have those type of problems, you want to contact um, our Easy Air administrators, and they are Kevin Conley and Jason Dowie. Um, I put their phone numbers up on the screen there. There's also an email, uh, easyair at, at dnr.iowa.gov. And I was told that that was probably the best way to contact them, because if one of them is not around and the other one is, um, they both will get that email. And I think there's a, a third person, Jessica, who also gets that email. So probably the email will get you uh, to them uh, the quickest. But you should just be aware of that, that um, these guys, Jason and Kevin, have been doing this for three over three years now. So they're very experienced. So system type questions would go to them. On the other hand, then, when, once you get into Easy Air, you're going to be filling out forms just like you would if you were doing paper applications. And when you get stuck uh, at that point, then we recommend that you call the construction permit helpline, um, 877-AIR-IOWA, and we would help you with, you know, things like uh, what forms to fill out, the calculations, if you had questions about limits, things like that. So just keep that in mind, and like we have this two, two groups for support, and try to figure out what your question is and try to get it to the right person. 
I also want to add that uh, the University of uh, Northern Iowa, uh, Iowa, the Waste Reduction Center, uh, has a program for small business assistance. It's free. Um, so they can help you get your account set up, uh, ha help you figure out what application forms you need, and then help you with, you know, calculations and things like that. They cannot do the application for you, but they certainly can provide a lot of assistance. So take advantage of that. Okay. The other thing I want to go to is our website. Um, and I want to show you on our website, how we would, uh, the support that we have on the website. So if you go to the iowadnr.gov website and you go to environmental protection, I wanna show you uh, really, there's probably four or five uh, places to go where we provide assistance for doing your application. And the first site, if you scroll, if you get into the air quality website and you scroll over here to air, ER services, um, this is the location where we've developed a lot of guidance, a lot of instructions, training information that, again, when you're filling out an application in Easy Air, you're going to have some questions. And so this would be a really good place to go to to find some answers. So if you go to this um, page, there's some tabs here. Access help would be just like registration type of uh, questions. Um, if you are working with a new facility, the very first thing you need to do is fill out a form. It's called the facility number and name change form. And you have to request a, a facility ID number. That's the very first thing you need to do in order to get the facility into Easy Air. So if you have a brand new facility, uh, keep that in mind. The second tab, uh, instructions. We have developed a lot of uh, instructions, a lot of FAQs um, that are very specific to topics in Easy Air. Um, there's one on fees. There's one on you know, user accounts. Um, there's one here on tips. We have one just giving you some uh, tips that we've uh, developed over the years in our experience with, you know, working with people, uh, trying to use Easy Air. And, and if we have time today, we'll maybe go through some of those tips. Um, I also want to bring to your attention down here in the lower part where it says new. We now have, and this is actually another enhancement or an improvement that just uh, was developed last year. We now have detailed step-by-step uh, uh, instructions for the different applications uh, for construction permit in Easy Air. And don't be fooled by the title where it says Construction Standard Application Quick Guide. Don't think this is just going to be some, you know, two-page thing like when you're getting a new computer and you have to set it up. Uh, this is a 59-page document. And it really goes through everything that our um, old directions on our old paper forms would go through. Um, we've taken all the paper application forms down um, from our website, but if you're looking for directions, specific directions, like let's say you're trying to fill out the, the EP form, well, here's some specific directions that maybe is gonna explain what a vertical uh, uh, obstructed stack is. So again, everybody's level of understanding of construction permit applications is different, but if you're relatively new, this would be a great thing to have um, at your side as you're working on your application, all right? And I'll show you, when we get into Easy Air, I'll show you how you can access these directions right from the system. Okay, the other thing I wanna show you is on the DNR website, uh, under construction permits, where we used to have our old application forms, like I said, has pretty much, they've been pretty much uh, removed, but we now have what we call Iowa Easy Air attachment templates. Um, as we're gonna find out, there's some information that you can attach to Easy Air, uh, emission inventory, greenhouse gas um, information. And we left up some of these uh, template forms that you could now use as an attachment. So for example, uh, here's the one for emission inventory attachment template. 
this is just simply our old EI form where you have to provide, you know, a list of all your emission units at the facility with the potential to emit and provide us with a summary. Some of you are already familiar with this form. Well, we've left this up and you can have this, you can still use this form and just simply attach it to Easy Air. All right, so don't, um, don't give up totally on paper. There's still some good things here. The other thing I want to show you real quickly um, is again, geared for folks who are maybe doing this for the first time, or maybe, you know, are new, where you have to estimate emissions. Every, every application we receive, there has to be an estimate of what the emissions are going to be, or what you expect the emissions are going to be from the, from the uh, source that you're trying to permit. And that's a challenging job. Uh, emission calculations is not easy. So this document was developed uh, a number of years ago, um, recommended methods for completing construction permit application form EC, which was the emission calculation. So again, this is a 42 page document and it just goes through all the different ways to try to estimate emissions, you know, emission factors, stack test, things like that. Um, there's, I'll take you all the way to the end here. There's even some example uh, calculations. Okay, so for here's one for a diesel engine uh, example calculations. We have a table in here where you can get information on estimates of control efficiency. So in other words, you know how efficient is the cyclone for removing particulate? You either get that have to get that from a manufacturer or you have to find something published on that. So this is kind of like your your place to go. If you're stuck and you can't get anything else, you could always come here and, and check this. So uh, just keep that in mind. There's a lot of information here. It's just a matter of, of finding it. All right. I also want to show you, again, on the Iowa DNR Air Quality Bureau website, there's a, a, a link here for emissions inventory. I know many of you have to do the EIQs. Uh, they have some nice spreadsheets, or I'll just say we, that's not a separate group, it's the DNR Air Quality Bureau, has some good, um, simple Excel spreadsheets for calculating missions for, let's say, abrasive blasting, so like a blast booth, uh, haul roads, um, painting calculator. So check some of this stuff out. Um, it will help you when you're trying to do your calculations. There is a link here also to AP42 which everybody probably is, if you're doing any work in air pollution, you should be aware of this document. It's an EPA document. It's this large compendium of uh, emission factors and descriptions of all sorts of air pollution type sources. So there's a link you can get to that document from uh, the DNR website. So check that out. Okay, and then the last thing I want to show you again on our website is the greenhouse gas emissions. Um, every application that gets submitted to us has to include information on greenhouse gas emissions, the potential. That's that's in the state law. So there's a uh, a tool here that I want to show you that's called the Stationary Fossil Fuel Combustion Calculation Tool, and it's just a simple Excel spreadsheet. But if you have any sort of combustion going on in your project, this is the go-to place to, uh, to get information on greenhouse gas emissions. You'd go to the second tab, potentials using maximum capacity. You just have to find your fuel that you're burning, how many gallons per hour are you burning, how many hours a year is the source operating, and then it's gonna give you an estimate of greenhouse gases. So um, uh, that, that again should be very useful for you. And uh, I just wanted to make this make everybody aware of it before we got going here with the training in Easy Air. Okay. All right. Now uh, let me go back to Easy Air and we'll get going here. <clears throat> get this bar out of the way. Okay. So you're going to start out with this first screen here, and we're going to log in. And, you know, again, this is where you've got to get your uh, account set up and your password. 
Okay, so when you get into Easy Air, the first thing you're going to see is your dashboard. And I want to just give you a quick overview of the dashboard. It's broken up into, and everybody's dashboard is going to basically look like this, although everyone will have more stuff. The more stuff you get, it's going to change the way it looks. But it's basically broken into four areas. There's up here in the top left corner, start a new submittal. This is where you're going to go if you want to get going on a brand new application. You're going to click this blue button, apply new submittal. You can also um, click this second blue button if you're going to be submitting uh, one of these non-permit reports that Daniel mentioned. So this would be the, the starting point for any time you're uh, going to create a new application. There's another way to do that, and I'll show you that in a minute, but this is what this is area is for. In the, in the dark uh, brown here on the left uh, lower is the message center. Uh, Easy Air is going to be sending you, within the system, Easy Air will be sending you emails on significant events. So when, an app, when you submit an application or when you get a permit issued, you're going to get an email from the system. And that email will be saved within your Easy Air account. It's also going to go to your regular email account, but it will be saved here in the message center. Over here in the light yellow, we have upcoming submittal obligations. Um, these would be primarily uh, start of construction notifications and start of operation notifications. These are required reports that whenever you get a permit, you're required to submit to us. And if you're late or you know if one is due, you will get a reminder from uh, the system. And then finally, this uh, grid area, this table area here, permits, licenses, as things get issued to you in Easy Air, your permits will start appearing for your different projects will start appearing here, and you can actually access the permits uh, this way, although there's probably a, a lot easier ways to do that. Okay, I want to go through up here, I'm, I'm on this blue line up here, my dashboard submittal. I want to go through under submittal uh, these different actions here. So the first one here is click on it and you will get, uh, it's called start a new submittal. And again, this is what this is how you can begin uh, the application process. Now, each one of these large icons is a different application type. If you're a Title V facility or what we call a major source, you're gonna get uh, these applications associated with your account. If you're not a Title V facility, or if you're not gonna be working on Title V facilities, you probably won't, won't have these in your account, but these are for the Title V or the major sources. Down here, we have the different construction permit applications, and there's actually 11 of them all together. Uh, the one over here in the corner, rescission, is not actually an application for a permit, but it's your way of rescinding uh, or, or requesting a rescission of a construction permit. And this is uh, something that you wanna have on your account, especially if you have a lot of permits and you're gonna be you know, maybe putting in new equipment, getting rid of old equipment, you wanna uh, send us a rescission request to get rid of that uh, those old permits. And Daniel will, We'll talk about, show you how to use this uh, later on today. Focusing on the 11 applications, these different large icons here. Down here in the blue is the construction uh, standard application. Okay, so that's the one we're gonna start off with this afternoon. We also have five permit template applications, or we call these general permits. And these are for specific industrial categories. Um, you have to meet certain eligibility requirements to use these. We will be we'll, we will be talking and showing how to use one of these later on today. But the five are the aggregate processing plant, bulk gasoline plant, group two grain elevators. I'm sorry, and I missed one here. Uh, the concrete batch plants, and then the hot mix asphalt plants. So those are those are called general permits or permit templates. We also have a couple of registration type uh, permits. One is for the smaller grain elevators. Those are the group one grain elevators. And then the other one is for uh, the paint booth by rule, which is uh, for facilities that commit to using less than three gallons of paint a day. Uh, a lot of body shops will use the, what we call the PBR. 
Uh, then we have three that are a little bit different. Uh, construction determination is when you submit to us a determination request and we formally send back to you a determination. This could be on a, a applicability of a rule, a uh, single source determination, uh, asking us to review calculations for a small unit exemption. So this is kind of like, if you need to get something back from us in writing, this, this is a good way to go, is to use the construction determination. Uh, we'll show you how that works uh, later. The uh, one here, the PAL, uh, plant-wide applicability limitations is a very specialized permit for major PSD sources. It's kind of done on a pollutant by pollutant basis. Um, and it's where you can get like a limit on a single pollutant to allow you some future flexibility um, at your facility. And then the last application is the construction pre-application. Uh, typically where this is gonna be used is when there's a large project and uh, there could be a lot of questions before the actual application is submitted. Uh, this allows you to fill out as much as you can, uh, send that into us, ask us to review it, and then we would get back to you with any comments or questions we have. So that's used, you know, if somebody's putting in like a brand new, very large, complicated thing, and they just want to maybe have a lot of questions at the beginning of the application process. Okay. We also have under submittals, my favorite submittal. So, you know, you can, you can tag these, um, applications. And if one is the one you're going to all the time, you can just sort of tag it, give it a heart. That's one of your favorites. Um, once you sub, uh, start working on an application, this is important to know. Once you start working on an application, um, the system, the easier system, even before you submit it to the DNR, is going to assign it a submittal ID number. And that's a, probably a good thing to be uh, cognizant of, and you, you probably should write that down. So here are some submittals that I've been working on that I have not uh, completed, but this uh, red number here, right in the middle, uh, 54915, 54924, these would be the submittal ID numbers. So that's important for a lot of reasons. One, it helps you you know, find it. You can do a search on it up here. There's a search. You can search under submittal ID. And um, so if you're working on a bunch of things and you're want, trying to find it, you, you wanna just jot this number down so you know where it is. The other reason is when you go to pay, if you have to pay by check, uh, we're gonna ask you to write the submittal ID number down on the check or communicate that number to us because otherwise sometimes checks will be uh, unknown. It's kind of unknown what they're for. So submittal ID number is very important. One thing I want to uh, go back to real quick is in the start new submittal, I want to point this out here. There's at the bottom of these big icons, these little icons, and they're really, uh, most of them aren't really showing you much, but the one that is, is the one that has the, que the blue question mark there. So if you click on that, uh, that's going to take you to that um, detailed guide uh, that I was showing you before on uh, the quick guide, which is actually for like for this one, it's 22 pages. So this is how you can access the directions, the specific directions for your application uh, right inside Easy Air. Okay, so take advantage of that, uh, make use of that. All right, all right. Now, uh, so these would be, be, you know, you're working on your application, start it, uh, you're editing it, going back. Then when you submit it, okay, show you what that looks like under track submissions in your account, then, then you will see it in this table. So these are all applications that have been submitted and they're at different, um, they're at different stages. Uh, maybe we're waiting for the payment or maybe the permit has been issued. So it's gonna show you, it'll, you know, over here, on the right, it'll tell you exactly what's going on. Maybe that application was withdrawn. Um, and so there's a lot of information. If you want to go back and, and see what you've submitted, you would click on that view button. And now it's going to take you back to your application. And as like Daniel was saying at the beginning, if you need to go back, you can, you can click on any of these. These will show you your 
the PDF of your application. If you want to look at everything, you could just hit this blue button. It'll download all the forms together. So now you'll have your, your application. Um, you can also see there's a tab here for payment. So we can see here this, this, uh, this has been paid. Uh, email history will give you a summary of all the email that has been going on for that project. So um, take a look at that once you're into the system and track submissions would be for anything that you've successfully successfully submitted. So if let's say you submit something and you thought you submitted it to us, if you don't find it in track submissions, then it hasn't it hasn't gotten into us yet. So you'd want to kind of use this as a check uh, on where your application is. All right, manage permit and certificates. Uh, I won't say much about this. This again is where once something gets issued, it'll show up here for the project. And then email history is just a history. Uh, you can search under submittal IDs for different emails. Then the last tab up here in this little blue ribbon, uh, my account, click on that. Uh, this is primarily stuff that Kevin would have talked about yesterday, or I'm sorry, this morning. Um, I'm not going to go through this, but if you uh, are, let's say, a responsible official and you need to um, associate consultants or preparers with your account, uh, this is where you would go. Um, if, let's say, your um, company is starting up a new facility and you need to add that facility to your account, you're going to go here to associate facilities. And again, this is where you kind of manage your account. So I'm not, you know, this is kind of getting beyond what we want to talk about today for applying for a permit, but you should just be aware that this is where you would go would be in the My Account. Okay. So having said all that, I think we're ready now to start um, the application process. So let's go back here. And again, remember, you can um, start this whole thing either by clicking on this blue button or coming up here to submittal and say, start a new submittal. Okay, so that's what I'm going to do. And again, as we're going through this, if questions come up, just put them in the chat. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you uh, how to do an application for a standard construction permit. And so the way to do that is you find the large icon. Um, if you don't see the icon when you get to this point, that means you need to get that added to your account. Okay, so sometimes... Uh, folks don't get uh, all the applications they need. These can be added to your account. You have to go through a request process. You would come up here where it says up here um, where I'm highlighting the red submittal types associated with my account. And uh, you can click on that and there's some directions that'll take it through. But so a standard application CP, there's a blue little blue button down in the lower right corner says start. So we're going to click on that. Okay, and that's going to bring up our first screen. All right, I want to uh, give you a little bit of a uh, tour here of this first screen because this has got um, a lot of information here. On the left side of your screen, there's what we call the wizard panel. The wizard panel is kind of giving you the major steps. And when we look at these uh, wizard panel, uh, there's five steps identified in the in the large red uh, button. So we got one data entry, two attachment, three validation, four payment, and five submission. These are the five main steps in Easy Air. Within the data entry step, you have 10 forms to fill out. And some of these forms, one or two of these forms will be optional. Most of them are not. So within the data entry, you've got the majority of your work to do. Once you get that done, then things will go fairly quickly. But the data entry will definitely be uh, the bulk of your work. One thing that's important, and you know, sometimes you can't stick to this entirely, we recommend that you fill out these forms or the, you know, the, do these steps in the order that they're presented here in the wizard guide or the wizard panel. 
So start out with facility information, cover page, emission point, control equipment, go in order. Because sometimes what will happen is the forms downstream or towards the end are kind of relying on information for the upstream forms. And so if you kind of do things backwards, it may mess things up for you. Um, if you start filling out a form and you don't know everything, you have to leave some of it blank. Just save the incomplete form, go on, but then make sure you go back and fill in everything that you need to fill. All right, now we're looking here at the top of this form, and this is uh, equivalent to what we call the FI form, facility information. It's a form where you're just giving us people's names and contact information. The first question is reason for the application. Is it a new application not yet constructed, new already constructed, maybe, maybe it's uh, as built or it's been operating under an exemption, modification, is it a determination? We are not asking you to check rescission using this form. There's a separate form for this. So don't ever try to use the standard construction permit application to rescind a permit. So just ignore that. That's just part of this software, but don't use it. And then the third one or the last one would be, is this application gonna be for a, a PSD project? Uh, that would be a large uh, facility making a major modification. In our uh, sample application, we're gonna be installing something new, okay? And before I get too far along, let me just show you what we're gonna be installing real quick. Um, all I'm gonna be showing you today is how to install, uh, apply for a permit for one new emission point, and it'll have one new uh, control equipment and it'll have two emission units. It'll have a grain receiving emission unit and a hammer mill. They'll both be tied to a bag house going through one uh, emission point. Okay. Let's say in this project, in addition to the new emission point, I was also gonna be modifying a permit of something that's already uh, in place. Then I would just check modification also. So just check as many uh, as you want in this area. Uh, new, new and modification, new already constructed, whatever you got, just check them all for whatever your project's gonna be. Within Easy Air, when you're working on a submittal, and here's my submittal ID number up here, 54940. So I'm gonna write that down. So when if this thing, if I run into trouble, I can all go back and find it easily. Keep in mind, whenever you're doing a submittal in Easy Air, you can apply for one construction permit, or you could be applying for a hundred construction permits all within the same submittal. You don't need to have a separate submittal for each permit. You can have multiple permits on one submittal. Okay, the next, the next question that we need to address is the facility information. So there's a field here, company facility name with a dropdown uh, on it. And I only have one facility that I'm associated with. If you are the RO, uh, or the per permit preparer for more than one, you need to make sure that you know you might see multiple facilities here. Make sure you're clicking on the the correct facility. So just be careful with that. We've had sometimes people have applied for the wrong facility, and then that can lead to some um, situations, some errors. Easy Air. Once we do that, Easy Air will pre-fill uh, the facility address information. That'll all be in there. Facility number will be pre-filled. Um, Easy Air will tell you what the billing status is. Now, <clears throat> for the fee, for the purposes of fees, we break facilities into two categories. Minor sources are facilities that are not major for Title V, and they pay a flat fee of $385 per permit. Major sources are the Title V facilities, and they pay at the after the permit is issued on an hourly rate. It's a billable uh, fee based on the hourly rate. This facility is classified as minor by the system. When you're working on the application, you will see that you could change that. So let's say you think the facility is really going to be, it's really a major source right now. You, let's say you think Easy Air is wrong. You could change it, but it would be a good idea to talk to us first 
because by doing that, that's going to affect the way you get billed or maybe you haven't sent money in or going to send money in. So make sure before you start uh, thinking that that billing status should be changed, you, it would be a good idea to contact us. And this would be a good question to send over to the easier administrators and say, hey, how come we're classified as minor when we should be major and vice versa? Okay, the other thing I want to point out here right at the beginning is you will see that some of these fields have a red star uh, in front of them or above them. Whenever you have a, a field with the red star or the red asterisk, that's required information. If you have a field like position title where there is no red star, that's optional information. There are some forms where I think we recommend that you fill in all the information because it's probably going to be something that we're going to need and we may ask you for it anyway. So if you know the answer, even if it's not required by Easy Air, I would recommend uh, providing it just so you don't have to um, have us then now contact you saying, hey, we really needed this piece of information. And now you've got to spend time providing us with that. All right, so we're going to provide the contact uh, person's name. And then a lot of times there'll be, you know, I'm just going to save time here. We'll hit that, pre-fill it a little bit with the phone number, email address that's already in the system. Uh, the next thing we have to provide is the uh, equipment location address. If that is the same as the facility address, and most of the time it is, you could just click on that box there, and then it will carry that address through. Um, if there's a different person that the permit should be mailed to, and we don't mail permits out anymore, we email them to people. So if that's a different person, then that information should be provided here. Again, if it is the same as the facility contact, you would just click on that a box and it would pre-fill it for you. And then the mailing address. We also need the mailing address. Again, it, it seems like it's a little bit out of date because we don't mail permits anymore, but we're still asking for that. If that is the same as the facility address, so we just click on that and then that would take care of that. But if it's different, you'd want to fill that out. Okay, then it then the last part of this form, there's a couple of, of, of yes, no questions. Do you want to review draft permits? Yes or no? We we send draft permits to companies that request the, the ability to review them in the draft form uh, to look for errors or to look for things. Maybe there's something that's not quite right, and you have a chance to talk that over with the permit writer before we issue uh, the permit. It's not a 30-day review time. It's more like a three-day review. We don't. This isn't like we're sending anything out for the public. This is just so that we get things right and we don't make some gross error that we have to come back and, and fix. So we recommend that you check yes to that question. Uh, is the equipment portable? <clears throat> some equipment by design uh, can be moved from location to location, uh, either within a facility or at different addresses. Uh, you know, a lot of times it would be like a concrete batch plant, aggregate processing plant. If your equipment is portable and it's designed to be portable, then you'd want to check yes. If it's stationary, never going to move, then you would check no. Uh, and then the last question is an important one here. Uh, was the application prepared by a full-time employee of the company? If it, if it is, you're basically done with this form. Okay, so if you work for the company and you're the permit preparer, you don't need, again, to fill out uh, any of this information here. It's not required. But if you're a consultant or if you're having asking a consultant or paying a consultant to do this for you, then it should be checked no. And then the information should be filled in. All the required information should be filled in here under permit preparer. Okay, so name, phone number, address, Iowa PE number. And in addition to that, <clears throat> there's an attachment that has to be made where there's a document here that has to be signed and a, you know the, num the PE number seal and stamp has to be included there. So make sure you're, you're catching that because if you don't, then that's gonna be incomplete. Um, your application will be deemed incomplete. 
Now, let's just see what happens if I don't fill in this required information. So now I'm going to, I'm down here at the bottom, I'm going to hit save to save this form. And when I click on it, then I see, uh oh, I've got red, uh, some data fields that come up in red. And then way up here in the top, oh, it said save submittal. That's not right. You should get an error message up there also. It didn't do it. But whenever you see fields highlighted in red, that means you have not uh, filled in that information. You can go on now. Let's say you didn't know this information. You could go on to the next form. But when you get to the validation step, it will catch it and you'll have to go back and fill it in. So you'd probably, if you were going to skip this, you'd probably want to make a note of it and then and, and then make sure you come back before you get to validation. All right, so I to clear this, then I'm just going to say, I prepared it. I work for the company. So now it's not required. And now I'm going to save it. And now I can move to my next form. Hey, and John. Yes. Before going on, I have a question here in the chat um, regarding the previous screen. Uh, it says, would the new already construct be something that you install that comes as a plug and play, quote unquote? Or does new already constructed mean you installed something from scratch? and didn't get a permit for it yet. Okay, um, the, the regulation says you have to get the permit before you, you commence construction. Um, so if let's say you ordered a piece of equipment and all you were gonna do was to set it up at your plant, ready to go. If you, if you set it up ready to go at the place where it's gonna be operated, we would say you've already started construction. If this say uh, this machine was in a crate and you had it like in a warehouse somewhere, not anywhere near what was going to be operating, you got to be careful with this. And I don't want to go into this because this could be a compliance situation. But you know, there's at some point um, you've started construction. Uh, other times, though, it may be that it's it's not anywhere near where it's going to be operating, and then that would not be considered commencing construction. So uh, I would just recommend trying to get the permit issued before you bring anything um, out to your facility. But let us know if there's more, uh, more questions on that. <clears throat> All right, the next form is called the cover, cover page form. Uh, the purpose of this form is again, to provide more detail about the facility and also about the application. Um, as a lot of you know, uh, air regulations kind of hinge on a lot of times on the facility, and then obviously they hinge on uh, what the equipment is. And there's so many different types of air sources out there that, you know, it's really, especially when you get into things that are kind of unique, uh, we really kind of rely on a very good description of the equipment in the application. So the first question is going to be uh, company description. So provide a, a description of the company. This doesn't have to be elaborate and you have a choice of either uploading it and I'll show you when we get to the attachment uh, step, you can simply upload an attachment of your description or you can type it in. So there'll be a little box here that'll show up. And if you click on type in then, uh, you can type in the name or the business that you're in. So this is gonna be like a feed mill. <clears throat> so we're gonna say our business is a prepared, prepared feed manufacturing. doesn't have to be, you don't have to go through the history of the company, um, but if you want to, you can do that uh, or just do a, do a upload. Then the next question is to provide a description of the application and also the goals of the uh, permit request. Um, you know, sometimes applications are very straightforward. Hey, we want to put in a new boiler, but sometimes they're like, hey, we want to put in a new boiler and we want to modify you know, six conditions in this one permit we've had since, you know, 1995. So there you really would have to go through a lot of uh, explanation of exactly what you want to do, especially when you get into modifications, okay? So new stuff, it's basically, hey, we want to put in a new something, but modifications, a lot more complicated. So again, here you have the option of uploading or typing it in, and I'll just, you know, type it in. And we're just going to install a new grain receiving and hammer mill. <clears throat> um, 
the more elaborate the process is, then the more information you want to give on, uh, to us because we may then come back to you with questions. So just try to be thinking ahead a little bit on what information are we going to need to make sense of your application. All right, the next question is, do you want DNR to issue your permits under a cap? A cap, is, and I know some of you have seen these, these have been around, gosh, for a while now, maybe seven or eight years. It's a collection of air permits put into one document. And it's typically done when you have a lot of similar sources or maybe sources that are all kind of operationally united. So let's say you have a bake oven with four stacks. Instead of getting four separate documents, we would put the four permits into this one cap document. There's still four permits, but they're all in one document. Here, we're only gonna have one permit, so we're not gonna request a cap. Okay, the next uh, questions relate to your SIC code, which is standard industrial classification code, and your NAICS code, North America Industrial Classification System. These are codes that um, are out there, uh, US Department of Commerce, other federal government agencies have set up this industrial code system. And, and these are used in air pollution regulations and that's why we are requesting them. So you need to give us your best guess on what your SICK code is and what your NAICS code is. Now, if you don't have a clue on this, then you would just call the helpline, construction permit helpline, and we would help you out. There is, if you look here, and one thing I wanna point out at this step, this little uh, question mark here is called a tool tip. And that will bring up a box that will give you additional explanation about what a SICK code is. So you would go to OSHA, the OSHA website, and just put in SICK OSHA SICK manual, and you will get a whole list of the SICK codes. So here's like, here's like all the SICK codes. You know, this, you know, you, you could, I mean, if you want to scroll through all this and try to find your your business, that would be another way you could search. But if you go to the um, the actual website, they'll provide a detailed uh, description of the industrial each of the industrial group that's covered by the SICK code. Same thing for the NAICS code. This is a six digit number. Uh, a lot of times what I do to find NAICS codes, I will just, if I know the SICK code, it's easier for me to find the SICK code. I'll just Google the NAICS for that SICK code and then there'll be uh, something that I'll find under the NAICS code that will be comparable, okay? If you have a, a business, a company that's maybe making two different things, then you would have the secondary activity, SICK and NAICS code, and you would fill that out also. Um, okay, we have one question here that's not required. We ask you to identify facilities within five miles of the permitted facility. So sometimes under air rules, uh, close by facilities get grouped together. Uh, this is something that we review all the time. But if you knew you had facilities that were close, you might as well tell us about it because that may uh, come up in the review um, down the road. And then finally, the last two questions are um, not easy uh, for a lot of folks because they deal with federal air rules and there are hundreds of them. And we don't expect you to be a regulation expert. So you do your best with this. Um, and this is something that we will always review. So if you miss it, we will catch it. But if you know you have an application with an emission unit subject to a Part 60 new source performance standard, you would click yes and then tell us, um, you know, what rule applied. Okay. And there's a link here uh, that will take you to the federal web uh, site and that will give you uh information about all these nsps rules okay so if you want to do a lot of research you could do that um but if you honestly don't know or you can't figure it out just click no or if you, i mean if honestly you know you're not then you would click no but if you don't know you also click no so don't think you're gonna get uh in trouble if you if you miss something here you do your best with it the second, the last question then is the same thing. It's part 61, part 63, federal rules, national emission standard for 
hazardous air pollutants. Now, anymore, it seems like just about every company is regulated by what we call a NESHAP rule, uh, painting is subject to 6H, uh, engines is subject to 4Z. You know, so it, it's hard to avoid these federal rules. But again, if you know it, you click yes, tell us what rule applies. If you don't think you're subject or if you don't know, uh, then you click no. Uh, prepared feed manufacturing uh, is subject to a rule. So I'm going to click yes. And it's really the whole facility that's regulated. And the rule is subpart uh, 7D. So for my pretend facilities making animal feed, um, it is subject to a part 63 NESHAP. So I'm going to say, yes, it is. Okay, so I've got everything filled out in this form. I'm ready to uh, move on. And when you want to move on, you can either hit save and then hit next. Or by hitting next, uh, clicking on next here at the bottom, that will save uh, your work. Now, like Daniel said at the beginning, if let's say you are not active, actively doing things in Easy Air, Easy Air will time you out. And so you will lose your work once you go back to it. So you want to be doing a lot of saving. If you think it's going to take you a while to get through a form, then make sure you're constantly saving that form as you're working on it so you don't lose any uh, data. Okay, um, picking up some steam here as I'm going through my application. The next form is for your emission point. Um, whether you're applying for a stack source, like we're gonna have, we're gonna have an actual stack, or you're applying for a permit for a fugitive source. So let's say you're applying to get a permit for some roads, or let's say it's a, uh, a truck loadout where you need to get a permit for that and there's really no stack on it. Well, you're still gonna need to fill out the emission point form. And this is kind of a key thing because if you're a minor source, uh, the number of permits you're applying for are related to the number of emission points. So keep that in mind. Actually, that applies for minor and major. For billing purposes, it's really important for minor. But let me just say, in for any source, the number of permits you're applying for uh, is related to the number of emission points you have in the application. All right, now, uh, when you get to this, you're gonna see this grid or table of all emission points that maybe are already in Easy Air that are associated with your facility. These may have come from SLICE. Uh, there was a migration that was done in 2019 where a lot of these were brought over from SLICE. So these may be some existing things that you know are already in there. But in this application, you are gonna apply for a new emission point. So you're gonna come down here and apply for a new emission point. This yellow button at the bottom, you're gonna click on that. And it'll bring up this form here, this small form that you now have to enter uh, the emission point information. Okay. So if you're applying to modify an existing permit, and I'll show you how to do it, you're going to be working off of what's already in Easy Air. But if this emission point that is new and it's not in Easy Air, then you have to create a new emission point. So that's what we're going to do here. We're going to create a new emission point, and we need to make sure we've got a unique. Uh, EP number, and hopefully the EP60 hasn't already been used. And we're just going to call it, um, I'm just going to call it grain receiving as the name. Uh, you can call it really anything. Okay, we have some red uh, stars here. So we have to provide the uh, diameter at the exit point. So it's a circular stack. And it's, we're going to provide the units are in inches. Make sure you're uh, giving us uh, the information in the correct units. So if, uh, one and a half foot, you can put that in, we would think the system would think that's one and a half inches. So make sure you catch the units on these questions. Uh, height from ground is going to be 30 feet. That's to the exit point of the stack. Again, there's, you know, all these questions have tool tips, a little bit more explanation on them. You can hover over those question marks and get more information. For discharge style, you have a number of options here. So you have to try to give us the correct one. 
vertical, vertical with rain cap, downward, horizontal. Uh, we do have some uh, folks applying for permits for indoor vented sources. So you would make sure you would use that option. And then if it was a, a fugitive with no stack, you would click on fugitive. So this is where you would uh, do that. Here we're gonna have a vertical stack uh, without a rain cap. We come down here now, we've got to give, provide the exit temperature and then the flow rate. Uh, this process is going to be inside a building. So I'm going to click on building ambient. Okay. If it was outside the building, if the process was outside the building, I'd click on ambient. If it's inside the building, it's building ambient. If it's a hot process, you're going to type in uh, the temperature in Fahrenheit. So we'll just go with that. And then the flow rate. Uh, it's going to be the CFM. And one thing that I will just bring to your attention here, uh, when you type this in, it's probably a good idea not to put a comma in. Don't use commas. I think we've had some issues with that where uh, it's looking for just a numerical uh, data entry and the comma may uh, screw things up. So uh, this is one place with the data entry, no comma uh, on the flow uh, entry field. Okay, so I check my work, looks good. I need to save this little form to go back to the main form. Okay, now what you'll see here is we've created our mission point, our new mission point. It is highlighted in red. And that's telling you uh, that you know, you've, su you've successfully got it in there. And then you see in this column, there's a little checkbox checked. And if we go all the way back up to the top, that means it's included in the submittal. So when you're working on an application, you want to make sure that all the emission points that you're going to be applying uh, for permits has this row, has excuse me, has the column check that says include in submission. All right. So if we were going to modify, let's say we were also going to modify uh, this boiler up here, it's an existing source. We would want to check that, and then we would want to go in to that form and make sure all the information was correct. So make sure you do that. Don't just take what you see out here. Uh, click on this icon under View Edit. That will open it up, and now you can go in and make any necessary changes. Okay. So, and and then another useful thing here is, let's say you've only got two things out of this big table that you're applying for. We actually have one. It'll, you can click on that uh, box there where it's just showing you uh, the emission points that are in the application, okay? So make use of that. So I'm gonna unclick that because we don't uh, wanna modify the permit for the boiler. We're just working on the one, one emission point, okay? So now I'm gonna save that, okay? And I up here, I get up in this uh, green, it says save successful. So I've, I saved that small form and now I've saved this large, large form out here, the main table. It's highlighted in red. I got that. I'm good to go to the next form. Okay. So we've done three of the 10 forms, and we're making some good progress here. Things are going to get a little harder for a while, and then it'll get easier when we get towards the end. So we're, we're kind of going up a hill, and then we'll, we'll be coasting in a little while here. So just uh, keep it going. The next form is for control equipment. Now, I, I think you want to make sure you're understanding that uh, control equipment means uh, uh, traditional add-on air pollution control equipment like a bag house, cyclone, scrubber, but it could also be something like water sprays or a low NOx burner or like a drop a tube when you have a loadout. So think of control equipment to be air pollution control equipment or air pollution control measures, because you want to give us that. If you're trying to take credit for some control measure and say it's going to be reducing emissions, we're going to need to list that on the permit. So you're going to need to list that in the application. Okay, now let's see how this works. It's kind of similar to what we did for the emission point. The first thing you're gonna see is this uh, grid or table 
of all the existing control equipment at our facility. So these are all existing. We're gonna install um, a new one. Okay, so we're again, we're gonna come down here where it says add new control equipment. What about if we have a process where there is no control equipment? Like just say a natural gas fired boiler. Do we have to fill out this form? No, you can just skip this form. So if the, if the process is truly uncontrolled, there's no air pollution control equipment or measure, you can just go right on to the next form, which would be the emission unit form. You're not gonna get an error message. You'll be good to go, okay? But here we're gonna have a bag house. So we need to add that now to Easy Air. So I'm gonna click on add new control equipment and we get this form here. It's a little bit longer than the one we filled out for the emission point. But we've again, we've got to make sure we uh, complete all the uh, fields that are starred red. Um, you, it doesn't hurt to provide more information. It's not gonna you're not gonna be penalized for that. You'll be given a, a pat on the back. That's a good thing. So the first thing we have to fill out first field is device type. Click on that. There's a drop drop down, and it lists some typical or common. Uh, air pollution control equipment. We've got scrubbers, we've got thermal oxidation, fabric filters, cyclones. Uh, dry filter actually is intended, I think, for paint spray booth. So like those flat panel filters, as, a as opposed to a fabric filter, which is more what we think of, you know, as a filtering system that, you know, is on larger uh, air pollution control sources. But I think dry filter would be the one if you're applying for a paint booth. Let's take a look at miscellaneous, okay? When we go to miscellaneous, okay, we would use miscellaneous if we can't find it under those other uh, ones that are listed there. Then we have like a sub uh, category, control equipment type. So we click on that drop down, and oh, here we've got a lot of different things. So we got flares, we got uh, internal floating roof. Let's say you're applying for a permit for a storage tank, low NOx burner, uh, maybe there's wet suppression. We got water injection. There's either an, even an other. So if you had some sort of miscellaneous other control device, you definitely would wanna provide some explanation of that because you know we wouldn't really know what it is. But anyways, this is miscellaneous. So don't forget about it uh, if you have some control device that doesn't fit into one of these uh, main control pipe measures. And if it's a control measure, not a, a control equipment, then you would definitely use miscellaneous. Here though, we're gonna go with fabric filter. So we click on that. We have to give it an, uh, a CE ID. So we're just gonna do that, CE60. Uh, if we know the manufacturer model, sure, I would give that if I know it. Date of on-site installation is required for the control equipment. So you get your, uh, you do your best on when you think this is gonna be installed. So we'll just say it's gonna be at the end of May. Uh, is there a capture hood involved? Okay, so sometimes bag houses, they're, they're set up where there's a, you know, an actual hood over a piece of equipment. Sometimes everything is just totally enclosed. And if that's the case, you would say there's no hood involved. But if you know there's some sort of a hood where not all the emissions are being captured, you'd probably would say yes. And then you'd probably have to estimate the capture efficiency. Here we're going to say no. Uh, this is a grain receiving and it's going to be you know totally evacuated. There's a pit where the, the dust is going to be and it's going to be totally enclosed by that receiving pit. So we'll just go with no there. All right, a little bit more information type. There's different types of bag houses. There's cartridge filters. There's bin vent filters. There can be some other things. So whatever is appropriate for yours, we're just going with a standard bag house. Um, Any more in the modern era of permitting, when we write the permit, we're gonna require some type of monitoring to ensure continuous compliance. So you wanna tell us, you know, how are you monitoring? How are you gonna be monitoring the performance of your controls? Uh, and this isn't just true for bag houses. This is gonna be true for scrubbers, and other things. So any control equipment, uh, we're looking for something from you that's going to be telling us this is what we're going to be keeping an eye on to make sure the control equipment is working properly. So here, uh, we're going to check pressure drop. 
Uh, that's a pretty common uh, monitor for a baghouse. Uh, visible emissions observation is another common thing that uh, sometimes people do. Uh, and maybe we'll say we're also going to do inspections and maintenance. That's pretty, pretty normal uh, expectation to do. And um, the range and monitoring for frequency, well, we're going to monitor the pressure drop daily. And maybe we'll even put in the range. It's two to six inches water column. Okay, so we're going to try to keep it within that range. And you get that information from the manufacturer. Um, we ask then if there's manufacturer's data, uh, if you are going to enclose that. And whenever we say enclosing it, we really mean attaching it to the Easy Air application. Um, we don't have that, so we're not going to provide it. But if you did, you would check yes, and then you would attach it. So we're just going to go with no there. Um, we've already given the pressure drop range, but if you didn't, you know, you you could do that here. Uh, filter media, if you knew what that was, the material, I'm sorry, the, the media material, um, you would just provide that from the information uh, from the options that you're given. Uh, bag cleaning method is required. Uh, most bag houses now are uh, cleaned by compressed air, so they're pulse jets. But the other options would be shakers, reverse air, other types. All right. So we get through that, and that's not too bad. So we filled in that. Um, and now we get to this controlled pollutant list. And we don't see any fields to fill out. So we're probably going to be kind of like, well, what are we supposed to do here? Well, this is where we have to indicate what pollutants are being controlled by the control equipment. And the way to access, to be able to access those fields, you have to click on the blue button that says associate control pollutant. So the first time you look at it, you're kind of like, what am I supposed to do? Well, you're going to click on these buttons. So you're going to click on that. And now that will open up your form. Okay. So this little form now, we have to enter in information about the pollutants that are going to be controlled. And we're going to also have to provide an estimate of the control efficiency, which you can get from the manufacturer. If you can't get it from the manufacturer, then you're going to have to rely on a handbook. And I showed you earlier, it's uh, there's some average control efficiency numbers um, in our construction um, uh, handout on how to do calculations. Now, there's a couple ways. The other tricky thing about this is there's actually, you now have to find your pollutants. So we're looking for particulate matter. And there's actually a couple ways to do it. One way is to come over here and click on CAP, which is an acronym for criteria air pollutant, and then do a search. And then it will uh, show you all the criteria air pollutants. And you can check off uh, the ones that your uh, control device is, uh, is working with. The other way to do it is to uh, just type in maybe PM. OK, so you don't have cap there. And then do a search on that. And then there they are. OK, so we've got uh, PM, total PM. Uh, it's also controlling PM10. It's also controlling PM2.5. So you'd want to probably check all three of them. And then our manufacturer is saying it's going to be 98% efficient. So notice this is 98%. Uh, so always control efficiency will be some number less than 100, going from 99 point whatever all the way down to one. And now before I close this little form, I have to save it. Okay. And now when it shows up on our main form like this, we have saved it. If we need to edit anything in here, we can just click on that view edit icon let's say the PM 2.5 control efficiency is really 95%. Okay, we could just update that and then we're good to go. So um, then and let's say we make a mistake and we've added a pollutant that it's really not controlling, um, you, will, you could delete it. But control efficiency is required, that number is required for the application. And I believe we get a lot of calls on that. So this is something Again, try to get that from the manufacturer or there is published general information on control equipment for a lot of, a lot of devices. 
Okay, we're almost done with this form. The last thing we have to do is we have to associate our control equipment. Remember, we're on the, the CE form, control equipment form. We have to associate it, link it with our emission point. And the way to do that is to uh, click on this yellow button, associate emission point. And what that does is that brings up a, a table uh, of all the emission points in our facility. So now we have to find the one that this uh, bag house is gonna be exhausting out through. And that is our new emission point, which is down here, EP60. But you know, if you've got a lot of emission points at your facility, you're gonna have to hunt for it. Make sure you find the right one. You're gonna click on that and save it. And then now when it shows up on our control equipment form here, we've made the association, all right? So this is kind of like an, a, a linking step that you have to do, okay? So we've got, it looks like we've got everything filled in here. So we can click on that save button. And now we will see our table. We're in red down at the bottom. We're including the CE60 bag house in our application. Um, if we want to narrow that down, um, we can see it by just clicking on that button. It just shows what's in the application. Uh, if, let's say, you had a cyclone in front of the fabric filter, second, it was uh, uh, in series, you would just add it in and also show that it's venting out through EP60. So you can have multiple control uh, equipment or measures associated with one emission point. Okay, again, we're going to save this uh, form now by either clicking on save and then next, or we could just hit the next and then go on to the next form, which is the emission unit form. Now, the emission unit form uh, has two primary reasons. One, you're providing technical information about the actual process that's causing the air pollution, okay? And then the second important thing for the EU form, mission unit form, is this is the form you use to request limits in your permit. Now, sometimes you're not gonna need limits, but if you know you're gonna need limits either to you know, avoid some other regulation or for modeling to stay out of modeling or stay out of Title V, remember to include the requested limits on the EU form. So that's that's the other important thing for the EU form. Now, again, we're presented with a table that shows all these emission units already at the facility, but no, we're gonna be adding something new. So again, just like we did with the other two, we're gonna go to the bottom uh, where it says add new emission unit. We're gonna click on that. And as you recall from the, from the flow diagram, we're gonna add two emission units here. We're gonna have grain receiving and a hammer mill. So we're presented with this form now. And so the first thing we have to do is find the correct emission unit type. This is kind of similar to what we had with the uh, uh, control options where we have some very specific ones. So we have cooling towers, boilers, uh, stationary internal combustion engines, non-metallic mineral processing plants, and spray paint booths. If you're process falls into one of these five, then you are going to use um, the form for a boiler, okay? But if it doesn't fall into one of those five, then you're going to have to go with the miscellaneous option. So obviously, we, a lot of times, what you're going to be clicking on is miscellaneous first. Then you're going to get an EU subtype where you have to sort of find from this uh, long drop-down list something that's uh, fitting, fits what you're actually doing. And maybe it doesn't fit. Maybe you can't find anything. So you just have to maybe use the unclassified option. But if you did that, you'd want to give us a really good description of what the process was. Uh, there's another one here that just says other fugitive or other process equipment. Okay, so that we're not going to be able to write the permit if you just left this as miscellaneous other process equipment without giving us more information, either in an attachment, or there is a place later on in this form where there's a comment field where you could do that. Um, here, I'm viewing uh, this as a transfer system, all right? So in other words, the grain's coming in on trucks, 
we're dumping it into a pit and then it's going out on a conveyor. So that's type of a transfer system. Um, it's a receiving pit and we might, we probably indicate that elsewhere in the application. Date of on-site installation, I think you should provide. I think that's important for any, any new emission unit. It really could be important for our regulation applicability. And so we're probably gonna ask you for that um, if, it, if you leave it blank. Uh, we have to give it a unique emission unit ID number. So I'm gonna do that. I think I haven't used 60. This is grain receiving is the name. Again, your option there, you can really call it whatever. It's a new unit, okay? If it was something that already had a permit, uh, you would click on this box and then you would give us the permit number. But if it's a new unit, um, you'd click on that. If it was something that was already installed at your facility, you'd click on the unpermitted existing unit. But this is a brand new unit that has not been installed. Uh, if it's got a manufacturer model number, uh, you can provide that information. Now we get into questions about the capacity of the, of the unit. So this would be the capacity, uh, the rated capacity of the transfer uh, system, the receiving pit. And we're gonna say it's five and we just put in the number five and it's tons per hour. And we have to uh, find that from this drop down. Okay, so we have to make sure we get the uh, correct units there. Okay, so that's the name plate, plate capacity. The field below that, sometimes there's some restrictions or bottlenecks where maybe this actually cannot, uh, it cannot fully accommodate five tons of grain an hour. So if that was the case, you'd want to uh, tell us, well, there's some sort of a bottleneck or a restriction that we can only handle like three tons an hour. You can give that as the process design capacity. Okay, then we'll provide information on material processed. And then, like I said, there's this comment box where you could provide, just type in more information. So let's say uh, we know that this, besides grain, we, we also can receive other feed ingredients too. Um, so you just type in whatever we think is gonna give the permit uh, reviewer uh, more information about what we're trying to do. Okay, so that's that's pretty straightforward, I think, on the uh, process. Now we get into the requested limit uh, part. Um, and I'll show you how to do this. And you know, there's a lot of reasons for requesting limits. If you're if you don't think you need limits or you really don't know how to request limits or why you would request limits, you would just check no. And then we will figure that out and let you know saying, no, wait a minute, if you don't take a limit, you know, you're going to have to go through modeling, or if you don't take a limit, the facility is going to be major for Title V. We're, we're not just going to write the permit and just say, oh, you're major now for Title V. So one of our jobs is to make sure we communicate to you what you're getting into uh, with, this, with this permit. Here we kind of have an insight that we need to request limits. So we're going to request two limits. We're going to request a limit of 2000 hours per year, okay? So we're gonna limit ourselves to 2000 hours and this will become a permit condition. So you just, you know, find that field, enter that in, get your units correct. Uh, you can also take a limit like in production or material usage. You know, if that was easier for you to track, you'd request those types of limits. If we were gonna track the amount of corn we were gonna receive, uh, we could limit you that way. The, the other thing we're going to do is we're going to add a limit. We're going to request a limit for particulate. And so we're going to add a new record here. And we're going to request an hourly limit for total particulate. If we wanted to do it for PM10 or PM2.5, we could also do that. But let's just do it with one of them. So we're going to request a limit of three. And then we actually have to type in our units here. There's no drop down. So we're requesting a limit of three pounds an hour. 2,000 hours a year, three pounds an hour. Now, you gotta be careful with some of these little uh, working tables that are in the form. In order to save this, you have to click on that check icon. And now when it gets into this format, it has been saved. Okay, so just be careful of that. 
The reason for the limit is we want to avoid Title V. Uh, and we'll also just say we want to avoid modeling. Okay, not that there's anything wrong with those two programs, but for us, we just want to avoid them. So we're going to type in our reason, and that's going to help us understand why you've requested them. Um, if you don't have a good reason to request them, then maybe you don't need to request them. All right, and then the last thing we have to provide is either a, a description and or a diagram, process flow diagram. Now, again, you could spend some time typing in the description of the grain receiving. Um, that's not so complicated, but if there was a lot more going on, you could, you could do a lot of typing. More importantly is to provide a process flow diagram, I think. That's really useful for the permit uh, application reviewer. So if it's not something really simple like a paint booth or, a, or an engine, but if it's anything at all where there's like, you know, several emission units tied to control equipment tied to one or two stacks, a flow diagram is really, um, really, really, is really meaningful. And it really helps out um, the engineer um, when he or she is reviewing your application. It's gonna save you a lot of time if you attach a process flow diagram, I think. So I would encourage that. Okay, so we've got this form filled out, but now we have to do some association and we have to do two associations. We have to associate the emission unit with the control equipment. And remember the control equipment was CE60. So we're gonna do that, click on that and then save that, okay? So now we've associated the emission unit with the control equipment. And now we're also gonna associate the uh, emission unit with our emission point. So we're gonna click on that. We're gonna find EP60 and we're gonna click on that and we're gonna save it. Okay, and then they show up here. So now we've got our emission unit linked to our control equipment linked to our emission point. We've got to have that, we got to do that association to make sure that Easy Air knows which emission units are going out, which uh, emission point. All right, so now we can save this form. You want to do that, don't want to close it, you need to save it. It will save all your information. And again, it will show up at the bottom. And now it's in red here, included in the application. We are going to add a hammer mill. So I'm going to do that really quickly here. That's also miscellaneous. We've got, we find it up here under chipper, flaker, hammer mill. There's one here. I'm going to go with that. Uh, we have to give it a, a unique EU number. It's a separate emission unit. Just going to call it the hammer. That's its name. It's another new unit. Capacity is the same as the receiving. Okay, so five tons an hour. Uh, grain again. And, you know, we got all that in there. Now, <clears throat> when you have a second, when, when we get here to this requested emission limits, if, if, if we've got a second emission unit that's going to be exhausting out um, the same stack as that previous emission unit, We've already requested limits on the stack, uh, 2,000 hours. We're, we're going to just keep the limits for the hammer mill is going to be the same. The uh, emission limit of three pounds an hour is also going to be the same. So you don't need to do that again when you have two units like this that are, are venting out through the same stack if, in fact, they're all going to have the same operating limits. So we're just going to say no. That's already been taken care of. And then we will do, you know, see the process flow diagram. But we do need to do the association. So anytime you enter any emission unit, you've got to associate it with the control equipment and you've got to uh, associate it with the emission point. And we have some facilities that have like 30, 30 emission units going into one stack. Okay. So you can have quite a bit of things tied into one stack and you'd want to associate all of them to the one piece of control equipment and then the one stack. So we've made that association. We're gonna save that. And now we see at the bottom here that both uh, EU60 and EU61 appear in our table. So we're, we're good to go there. So now I'm gonna save that. And now I'm gonna go on to the next form. Okay. 
We get to the emission calculations and we take a deep breath because now what we have to do is we have to actually do some work. Uh, and it might be work outside of Easy Air. We have to take out a calculator. Um, Easy Air will not calculate uh, things for you. Uh, you're going to have to do that outside of Easy Air and then enter it in um, to Easy Air. So we need to provide an estimate, our best estimate of what the actual emissions are going to be for um, this emission point, uh, it would be after controls. So we're not we're not asking you to calculate uncontrolled. You have to estimate your controlled, your best guess of, of controlled emissions. So the way to do that is, okay, we get to this screen, we have to add new emission calculations. And you will see there's a drop down here where we're gonna have to pick um, our emission point, which is EP60. And now we're told, that uh, what is our emission calculation method? Or now we're asked, what is our method for doing this? Are we using emission factors, mass balance, stack test, other? Um, if you were you know, not sure, you, you just need to um, maybe go back and look at our guidance on this. But a lot of times emission factors are used to estimate emissions. These are published um, information either from the EPA or they could be from some industrial group or the manufacturer. So we'd click on that, okay? Now, here at this point, you have an option of either uh, attaching your calculations. So let's say you did them in a spreadsheet and you just want to attach that. You can do that. So you would just check this box that says, check here if including calculations as an attachment. If you do that, you're gonna save this form, you're gonna click here, save the form, and then you will be done, okay? So we will certainly accept that, all right? But let's say you wanna actually enter them into Easy Air. Let's say you don't have a spreadsheet and you've just sort of worked this out on paper and now you just wanna enter it. So now you get to this point, you have to add a new record, okay? And again, what you have to do now is you have to find your pollutant which we're gonna do for particulate. So we do a search under cap. That gives us a, a list of pollutants. And here we're gonna to have to do it. We can't do all three of them. We're just gonna do one of them. So we're gonna do particulate. Well, maybe we'll do two. We'll click on that. So now we're gonna estimate our particulate emissions. So let's say we looked up and we find some emission factor and it's 30 pounds per ton of grain. And remember now, let's say this is a grain receiving and a hammer mill. So this is kind of like a combined emission factor for both emission units, because everything is going to go out one stack. And we go to this emission factor source where we've got, you know, different options here. And we're going to say that this came from like an EPA. We found an EPA uh, document that said for this process, this is an appropriate emission factor. So we type that in or click on that, enter it in. Now we have to remember what our bag house is, how efficient it is. And we, we remember it was 98%, okay? And so Easy Air will not calculate our emissions. So now we have to do it in our heads or in our calculators. And let's say that works out to three pounds an hour. We know we're only gonna be operating 2000 hours a year because that's a requested number. So that turns out to be three tons. So our potential annual emissions are three tons a year. Now, you have to be careful with this table. We haven't saved any of this data. If you just close, if even if you click this save down here, you would lose all your data. So within the table, you have to click on this word save. Now we've saved it. When it gets into this, when it looks like this with that icon on the far left, now it's saved. Let's say we want to add uh, PM 2.5. So we're going to do that for 2.5. So we click on that, uh, find 2.5. And let's say the emission factor for 2.5 is 10 pounds per ton. So we'll just do that. So we would do it for each pollutant that uh, we believe is being emitted. And we're just going to go with 98 again, just for make it simple and we'd go all the way across, okay? And then we would save that. So you would do that for as many pollutants as you think are being emitted out the stack. 
Um, if you got into HAPs, you'd want to try to estimate the HAP emissions. When you get all of that done, then you're going to hit this save here. But make sure before you do that, that you have the table looking like this, where you have that view edit icon. That means that you've saved your actual uh, numbers. So we're going to save that. And now this shows us that we've got our calculations done. Okay. So I went through that pretty quickly, but to get to that point, that takes some work. So you'd have to do a lot of figuring to get to that point. And there, you know, some sources will emit a lot of different pollutants, boilers. You're going to get, you know, five or six pollutants you've got to estimate. Okay, let's move on to the next form. Now, uh, this form, emissions inventory, is a little bit different in that it applies to your entire facility. Uh, and what it is, it's a, a list of all your uh, air sources, air contaminant sources, where you've determined the potential to emit for, for each and every one of them, and then you've totaled that up. We need this information because of the regulation. We need to make sure that if you're a minor source, that your potential to emit for the regulated pollutants are below you know, the major source thresholds, you know, 100 tons for PM10, 10 tons for a single HAP, 25 tons for total HAPs. So this is really a facility level form. You have to provide this to us. Now, if you're a major source for PSD, you only have to provide us information on the emission uh, units that you've either installed or modified within the last five years. But if you're not a major PSD source, it's a required, uh, the whole facility inventory is required uh, for you. So there's a couple of ways you can do this now. Uh, one, you can provide it as an attachment. And as I showed you at the beginning of this afternoon, you can go to our website, get that template and fill all that out and, and then attach it. No big deal. Um, or you can do it within Easy Air. Okay, so there's gonna be some tables here that you can actually uh, enter all the data in for the potential to emit. Now, I just wanna show you before I fill out anything that this is broken up into like three areas. Um, the first table would be for the stack uh, sources. The second, the one in the middle here is for fugitive emissions. Uh, most minor sources are not required um, uh, to include true fugitive emissions, but you want to make sure you know what a true fugitive uh, emission is before you, you know, don't include it. So if you have questions on that, contact us by all means. And then the last one would be a listing of all your exempt and grandfathered sources. These would be old things that were built in the 70 or before the 1970 that are, are not required to have a permit or all of you, if you have any exempt things, you'd need to include those. So everything at the facility has to be included on this EI form. Now, let's say we decide, no, we, we're not gonna do it as an attachment. We wanna do it in easy air. So you check no there, we're a minor source for PSD. Now we're gonna add our, we wanna add our new uh, stack. So we're gonna click on add new record. And then we're gonna find EP 60. So there's EP 60. And then we will have the name, we'll find our EU 60, there it is, EU 60 right there. Uh, we're gonna give the date of uh, on-site installation, let's say again, that was like May, something and the permit number we has not been assigned so it would be na now here is where i want to show you where uh, the improvement has been made uh, when we did the emission calculation we came up with three tons of pm and one ton of pm 2.5 this now has been carried over into the emissions inventory form so you don't have to do any more you'd have to probably give us pm 10 but the, the enhancements that Daniel was talking about at the beginning, this is this is a big one here, where it's taking what you enter in the EC form and then carrying it into the EI form. The other thing that is, the other enhancement is, let's say we have some other existing equipment there, like we wanna grab EP50. That's another uh, uh, thing that's still running, that's in operation. So we go through that, you know, that's been installed somehow. 
Here, even though EP50 is not part of our project for, we're not applying for a permit for EP50, but if we wanna enter it onto the uh, EI form, once we save this, it will be saved and it will be available for our next application. So the, the bottom line is the more you add to the EI, it will now be saved for your next application, where in the past you had to start over every time. Okay, so that's uh, two enhancements that Daniel uh, just highlighting a couple of the enhancements that Daniel was talking about uh, at the beginning of the of the training here. But I'm just going to have the one here. Let's say we just have this as the one source. So I will list those. If I had some exempt things, I will include them. But otherwise, and then down at the bottom here, it's giving me my total for the potential to met. So it'll add up everything. So that's kind of handy down there. Okay, and again, if you want to do it as an attachment, just click on yes, and then when we get to the attachment step, you'll be asked to, to provide it as an attachment. So I'm going to save that and then move on. Okay, uh, the next form is on the project greenhouse gas emissions. Um, the first thing it says up here is, Check here if greenhouse gases are not emitted from any of the emission units in this project. So for the greenhouse gas form, we're just looking at our project. Our project for this application is just the new receiving and hammer mill. If there are no greenhouse gases from those processes, then we can just click here saying um, no further information, no greenhouse gases, and then we'll be done. So that's what I'm going to do. If you did have greenhouse gases, then you would say yes, or you wouldn't check it, but then you would have to go, you'd have to be given the option of where you could provide the greenhouse gas information as an attachment, or again, you would fill it, uh, fill out these tables where you would have to provide the information on greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, if you're new to air pollution, greenhouse gases are primarily caused by combustion sources. Uh, there are some other sources of greenhouse gases that are not combustion, but if you do have a combustion source in your application, there will be greenhouse gas emissions. Um, I'm going to check here that there are not, so I will be done. Uh, again, I want to point out to you, if you want to get to our calculation tool that I showed you at the beginning, you come up here into this blue section, greenhouse gas emission page, that will take you to that spreadsheet that I showed you at the beginning of the training uh, session. So you can access that and then you could just fill in the table uh, based on what, what you calculate using that spreadsheet. Okay, so no greenhouse gas is emitted from my process. So I'm basically done. So I can move on to the next form. Okay, this form is called the non-PSD modeling determination form. This is actually truly an optional form. This is kind of like a heads up form where it would inform you if dispersion modeling uh, would be required by your application. Now that, that can be uh, an important thing, but if you, at this point, were just you know really just wanting to get the application done or you didn't think modeling would be required or you didn't really care, you would just say, um, uh, would you? The question is, would you like to determine if modeling analysis would be required? If you don't, you're just going to click no, and then you're going to go on to the last form. But let's say you think that modeling may be required, but you're not sure. So let's click yes and see where that takes us. Now, there's a lot on. There's a lot to this, but it's basically a two-step process that can get you into modeling. One way to get into modeling is if the project net emissions uh, exceed a significant emission rate. And the pollutants that are the ones that are modeled are listed here. So PM10, 25, NOx, SO2, and CO. We don't model VOC. So here what you do is you list the total increases for each of these pollutants. And as you can see that Easy Air has already picked up on the one pound that I entered in my calculation. So let's say I know there's PM10 emissions of two pounds. So I'm gonna enter that. If there was some old equipment that I was 
removing that, let's say this receiving pit and hammer will replacing, I could take some credit for decreases. I don't have that going on here. So I click, click the calculate, calculate button. And now it gives me the net change where I'm going to have an increase of two pounds PM10, one pound of PM2.5. These emission rates are less than what's called the significant emission rate. So over here in the final in the column on the far right, there's no check mark box uh, marked here, which would tell us that modeling is not going to be required due to this increase. Okay, so this I've cleared the first uh, step of modeling. No modeling required based on so far based on these emission limits that uh, or emission estimates that I've calculated. However, the other way a facility can get into modeling is if the facility has been modeled in the past and the modeling results show that the facility is close to a national ambient air quality standard. So let's say I know that the facility was modeled two years ago for PM10. It wasn't modeled for PM2.5, just for PM10. And that the facility contribution was 95 micrograms per cubic meter. I enter in the 95, I hit the calculate button, and it comes up with 149. The standard is 150. I'm so close to the standard that modeling is now going to be required for this project. So when you when you do your estimate here, you're not going to be above 150. You shouldn't be. If you're very close, if you're within, um, you know, if you're above 145 for PM10, 24 hour standard, you would see that checkbox over here. And that would mean this project would would require modeling, even though these emissions up here are low. So just be aware of that. Now, if you don't know if the facility has been modeled, you can contact us, we'll tell you. There is a link here that will take you to a web page, a DNR web page, and you will be able to request the what, what's called the Availability of Air Resources, the AAR. You just fill out this request, send that to us, and then we will tell you Oh yeah, the facility was modeled five years ago. Here's the modeling results. Okay, so keep that in mind that you can just, if you don't know what the, what the, if the facility was ever modeled, we will tell you if, if it's been modeled. It, it may show up in the records. If you do a record search, you will find that also. Okay, so for this project then, modeling would be required for PM10, but not for 2.5. All right, and then the last question is who will conduct the modeling analysis? And we're going to say, oh, we'll let the DNR do that. I'm not going to uh, try to do it. So I request the DNR conducts the initial modeling. And if you're going to request that we do it, then you're going to uh, have to attach to the application a site plan, uh, a plot plan, um, and then also make sure we have information on other existing units. And that's kind of explained down here at the bottom in this light green box. Um, so more work for modeling. Um, you just have to be aware. This form gives you kind of an awareness of it. Um, and, you know, again, if you think you're, you shouldn't be modeled, then you can review this with us and we would go through the different steps. All right. So I will save that and we will go on. Okay. We are down to the last form, which is form AF. And this is a payment form. And if you're a minor source, um, you, will, you will have nothing to do. If you are a major source, then you're going to get a screen that's going to look like this, where you have to give us the billing contact information, you know, who's, who's the contact for the payment. And then the RO has to, uh, there's a checkbox, and the RO has to sign it with a date um, agreeing to pay the fee. Because remember, if you're a major source, you're going to get uh, at the end of the project after the permits are issued, then there will be uh, we'll we'll send you the bill for the project, okay? But if you're a minor source, uh, there's no nothing for you to do at this point. Okay, so now we are done. We've done all our data entry. Hopefully, we we didn't miss anything. And I'm going to click next, and now we're to the attachment. A step. So we've completed step one data entry. We're now to the attachment step. Um, when we look at this, if we're required, if the if the system, if we were asked a question and we said, oh, we're going to do an attachment, then it will get caught here. 
So here it looks like we said we were going to submit an MI1. Now an MI1, it means a plot plan. So what I'm going to do now is I have to attach or I have to submit an attachment for the plot plan. And I can either do that by attaching it to my application. So that would be an online attachment. I can mail it to uh, the Air Quality Bureau at the Wallace Building here. Or I can do it other ways. I could fax it to us. We'd still have a fax number. Or you could actually walk it into our office and drop it off. But we're going to do the attachment online. So now we're going to do a, an upload. We'll go to find that attachment on our computer. I'm going to click. I clicked upload. And now this will allow us to uh, attach. Uh, and really, one good thing about easier is that there's a lot of flexibility in the types of documents um, you can attach. Uh, just to save time, I'm going to switch this to mail because it was. Uh, I just want to uh, try to finish, but I, the one thing I want to point out to you is up here in the blue, uh, a lot of different types of uh, file options. Uh, so if you have spreadsheets in Excel, you can just attach them. You don't have to convert everything to PDFs. But anyway, so uh, just to we're, we're kind of running up close to three, and we want to stay on schedule. So, but normally what you would do is click the online, and then you upload from your computer your uh, attachments. If there are other any other attachments, let's say you want to also attach process flow diagram, even though here it's listed as optional, you can just attach that uh, again. So there's a lot of uh, attachment options kind of built in uh, additive SDS sheets. Let's say, you know, you're painting, you want to attach some SDS sheets. Um, you can just do that easily. So easier. This is really, I think, a very good uh, feature of this system is you can do a lot of attaching. Um, the file size is pretty large, uh, 100, 100 megabytes. So usually no issues with that. Okay, so we will save this and we wanna move on to the next step, okay, which is the validation step. Now, <clears throat> at this point, if I had had an, if I had left something blank, didn't fill something out correctly, you would be directed back to the form uh, to fill that information in. So the validation is really a check to make sure that you've submitted all the required data. And if there were some attachments that were missing, that you've got all the required attachments. And here again, you can click on the uh, Adobe icon if you wanna see what you've already done. If you wanna do a double check on what you've um, completed, you can do that. Um, but we're going to say that this we've passed validation. We're pretty happy about that. So let's move on to the next step. Okay, next step is payment. Uh, payment can be made in a couple of different ways. Uh, one way to do it is through a check. So we come down here to payment method, click on check. And then what we're going to get is uh, information on where to send the check. So it's sending it here to the DNR. Uh, Wallace Building, fourth floor. If you do buy, pay by check, make sure you include the submittal ID number, which you can find up here on your check, or you, you attach or include with the check a copy of the receipt that you're going to get from the Easy Air system. Once you get through all this, you're going to get a receipt that you've successfully uh, submitted, so you'd want to include that submittal. Your other options for payment is to use this NIC system online checkout where you can pay with a debit card, credit card, or uh, e-check. So let's uh, try to do uh, that system. So we're gonna, we're gonna go with the online checkout and we're gonna go, we have hit next. And now we have to um, include our uh, certification information. So this is what you would normally do when you're right at the end of the application, when right as you submit it, you're gonna fill this out now. So you're certifying, you know, all the information is correct. You're paying all the fees. Now you have to enter, uh, you have to answer your security questions and enter your four digit pin number, okay? And we will submit. 
And if the online checkout works, it'll take us to like this portal, the payment portal. Um, as it's sort of scrolling here, there's also a lot of other things where the data is being sent out to slice and updated. So this step may take a little bit of time. So let's just, I'm gonna take a drink of water here as we're waiting. Um, and Easy Air is thinking that it's almost three o'clock, so we should almost be done. Very sometimes, and we get an error message here. So um, let me try to show you a different way. Um, let's see. Now, oh, Daniel, can we go back and pay by check and then go try to do it the other way? Yeah, so John, I think that you did submit the application. So if you yeah. go to track submissions, you should see it. Okay. It's just that the um it's just that the uh device notification didn't work in test. Okay, so let's see. So I'm gonna so should I go through this? Or... Let's go to the submittal up top. Okay. And then track submissions. So okay. this is five four nine forty. Right. Okay, so there it is. Yeah. It's right there, and I can I can uh, cancel out that payment from the test agency side, and you can go okay. to that IC payment portal. Just give me a second here. Okay, okay, but um, there are some steps you got to go through for the online checkout. Um, if there's problems with the online checkout, that is another uh, another situation where you'd want to contact. Uh, the easier administrators, either Jason or Kevin, um, they can help you out with that um, or send them an email. That isn't anything like an engineering type question. Um, but yeah, I guess we're encouraging that the online submission for the payment has been working. It is, it is newer than, you know, obviously the check method. We're encouraging people to use it because what happens when you submit a, a payment by check, it's going to delay uh, us starting work on your application because the check has to go up somewhere on the fourth floor and we have to be told that it's been received and that could take a couple of days. So uh, we're encouraging the online checkout for the payment. Um, okay, so John, you should be able to go back. Um... So if you just refresh that page, it should give you the option to make the payment here. Great, you did yeah. it. Okay. So the other, I just want to show you this. So when you're in this track submissions um, part of your dashboard, let, let's say we submitted this and you, you said you were going to pay by check, but then you decide, well, wait a minute, I'm going to just go online and pay that way. You can find your, you can do that by going here to track submissions and the blue button where it says payment means you haven't paid yet. So you could click on that. Okay, and now we're gonna try again to use the online checkout and it says make payment. And I can see what I did wrong there but I think now this will be okay. Make sure you hit the button that says make payment. Um, that's the one you wanna hit to do this. So um, within this online payment portal, portal excuse me, um, there is a couple of additional fees that I wanna make you aware of. And this is explained in our uh, FAQ. Uh, to use it, there's a, an access fee of $1.50. And then um, to off to allow us to accept credit cards because we have to make we have to pay them. There's a two and a half percent uh, charge added to you. So the total here for this application was three hundred eighty six dollars and fifty cents. Um, or I'm sorry, that'll be uh, the one fifty. And then now, if you pay by credit card or debit card, there's the additional two and a half percent. Uh, charge added. So we will go ahead with this. 
and I'm going to pay with a credit card. So you could do an e-check or credit card or debit card. Click on that. Okay, so now we're going to enter my name. Okay, this will all be fill that in. And now I'm going to enter the card number. Okay. Okay, and then this is where after you do that, because it's a credit card, then you see the other fee uh, calculated. So now the total is uh, the three eighty five, and then the dollar fifty that's assigned to everybody, and then the charge for using a credit card is a two and a half percent of your of your base payment, and then so there's the total. And now uh, we'll enter, you're going to enter your email address. And re enter that. Okay, and now we can process the payment. Okay, and um, it's going to send now uh, an email to your account. Okay. And okay, so the it takes us back to Easy Air and it shows us here under this payment tab. So again, this is in track submissions that the payment was successful and the amount due is zero. Okay. So um that's one way. You will also get an email from the system that I haven't gotten yet, but it will come that would allow you to go the same way. Um the receipt that I was talking about that you will get from the system is, is looks like this. This basically says when you submit it. So you want to find this receipt because this is the actual confirmation that everything went, uh, that the actual application was received by the DNR. Okay. And then the payment uh, to determine if you paid or not, you would go under track submissions and find it there. Okay. So again, now see, so for that uh, application, this one that we're working on, this, the blue is gone. So we've, we've paid it. All right. Um, I've got one more thing. We might as well just go through this quickly here. So we'll just close this out. So bear with me. This will just take a minute or two. Um, and then we'll take a 10 minute break. Uh, again, I just want to review. Um, so when you're doing an easier application, you have to prepare for it the same way as you would a paper application. So you got to do some preparation work before you dive into this, because otherwise you're going to get timed out a lot. And you're going to get frustrated. So do a lot of make sure you get some preparation done before you start. Uh, use our contact information to help you with your questions. Uh, the administrators for Easy Air. Those types of questions, engineers for technical questions. Uh, make sure you write down your submittal ID number and then follow that wizard panel when you're completing the forms. Make sure you click the save button constantly and throughout and these green check marks for tables. Um, make sure you've got on that one table, include in submittal for each emission point, control equipment, and EU that's part of the application. Otherwise, it will not be. Um, you need to have, or I'm sorry, you could use one easier submittal for multiple permits. And um, if you're modifying something that's already in the system, check it first to, for make sure it's complete. Don't assume that it's complete. Some of the uh, forms that got migrated over were missing uh, information. And then always save your work, um, save your work. 
Uh, finally, uh, PE signature document, that should be an attachment. CAP stands for Criteria Air Pollutant. Uh, do a complete form for each emission point, control device, and emission unit, the required fields. Uh, that control equipment form, you've got to associate control pollutant. That's kind of a, seems like a puzzle right there. What, what do you got to do? But make sure you just click on that, and then you search for your air pollutants. And then use the specific EU forms for boilers, engines, paint booths, and cooling towers. Um, don't use the miscellaneous form for those types of sources. And flow diagrams are, are valuable. Um, we appreciate them. You don't need them for everything, but uh, for anything that's a little bit complicated or even semi-complicated, they're appreciated. Okay, I think I am done with my uh, presentation. So let's take um, a 10 minute uh, public account again. And there are a couple different ways to modify a construction permit, but the best and, and preferred way to do it would be to start a new submittal. So after a permit has been issued, you will see your permits listed here on your dashboard and there's an action button. And one of the options is this modification where it takes that original application that you submitted and it creates a copy of that application that you can work on and submit. Uh, we've run into some issues when users have submitted their applications this way. And part of the issue is that the new application that started in the system is actually using old forms that might not be the current forms in the system. And there are, it might start a, a workflow that's an older workflow. Uh, there might be some data integrity issues. So we don't recommend using this action button. And we've already turned off the action feature for other um, aspects of uh, permitting. So there used to be a rescission option here, and I think at least one or two other options as well. Um, but we've turned those off and we're in the process of uh, removing this modification option as well. So we don't recommend using this action button uh, to submit permit modifications. So you can go here, uh, similar to what John just showed you, uh, you can go to apply a new submittal on the main dashboard, or you can start a submittal using this menu option here. So we'll go through a standard application here uh, real quick. But when you're submitting a modification for an existing source in the system, it, it's really straightforward, or it should be really straightforward, especially if the changes that you're making to that source are relatively minor. So in this case, we'll make a stack characteristic change uh, for an existing source in the system. So we'll go down here to our submittal type list and select construction standard application. And in this first, um, first question here, we're gonna select modification as the reason for the application. We'll go through the same steps that John covered already. So I won't spend too much time on these uh, steps here. So you can fill out all the contact information answer the questions down here. And we'll say this is prepared by full-time employee of the company. So we don't have to go through the uh, PE signature. And then here, we just put that this is a test site. And in our application description, we're gonna say modifying stack height. We don't wanna use the cap document. And not subject to any NSPS or NESHAP subparts. Go to next. Okay, so here uh, we see all of the um, emission points associated with this facility. The mission point John just submitted is down here as well. This is the GR receiving EP. 
EP60 that he was just working on. Uh, we're gonna go in and modify the stack height of this boiler stack, EP1. And we're gonna say that the stack height based on some recent measurements is actually, let's say 50 feet instead of 25 feet. So we save that, um, we save that change. You can see the table's been updated with the stack height of 50. And we're gonna include that emission point ID in the application. Then we're gonna click next. We don't have any control equipment that we're gonna associate with this specific emission point. And then we're gonna go to the emission uniform and there are no changes to the emission uniform for this specific application. We're just modifying the stack height. So as long as everything in the emission uniform looks correct, we shouldn't have to make any changes here. So we'll just wait for this page to load. Okay, so now on the emission unit um, page, we see the, the boiler here, EU1, that's associated with EP1 and EP2. Uh, we also added in some other boilers to kind of associate with that emission point. But for the purposes of this application, we're just gonna say EU1 is associated with TP1. We'll click include and submittal. We can go through and see if all of the information here is correct. Um, we're just gonna say it does look correct. So we'll just close, won't save anything. And then we'll click next. Okay. So to speed the application along, we're gonna say that we're gonna include the calculations on the EC form as an attachment. We'll just wait here, there we go. And then we'll click next. Okay, so we're gonna include uh, the mission inventory form as an attachment here, um, but here on the EI form, we can see the EP60 ID that John was working on um, and all the potential emissions. So this emission inventory form has been carried over from the most recently submitted application, which is the application John was working on a couple minutes ago. But we're gonna say we're gonna include it as an attachment and click next. Greenhouse gas inventory, we're gonna include that as an attachment as well. And then we won't do a modeling determination there. The AF form only applies to major sources. And then once we get to our attachments, we're going to select that we're going to mail those attachments. Save some time in the application here. Okay, so once again, we're at the validation uh, step of the application. And when we go over here, we can go online checkout or uh, check. And then we're just going to submit an application here exact same way that John submitted his application. Okay. 
Okay, so we're getting this error token again. So this is on the test site. And a little bit of background on this error. It's um, due to a web address that slice on the slice test site uh, is, is accepting from Iowa Easy Air. So one of the features of Iowa Easy Air is the fact that when you submit an application, it takes a little bit of extra time, but it sends the updated equipment list for the facility directly to Slice. And so in production, you'll see this. And then when you log into Slice, you're going to see the, um, the, the updated stack characteristics, updated equipment list. Everything's going to be updated in Slice. Uh, so the reason that this is showing up here is because the web addresses on the Slice test site and the Iowa Easy Air test sites aren't lining up right now. So it did still submit the application. And when you go to track submission, you're gonna see the updated submittal here to modify the permits, to modify the, the EP1 permit. Okay, so um, next, I wanna talk about withdrawing an application and the process you would follow to actually request a withdrawal. So in order to withdraw an application in the system, you would go to the project dashboard for an application. So in this case, we'll go to the project dashboard uh, for the project that I just submitted. And there's an option here if you get to, you see all the tabs up here for the project, all of the forms that you can download, you can download all the forms as one PDF. And then there's an option here, as long as the project, the permit hasn't been issued, this option should be available. And you can put here, you can put your reason for the withdrawal here and then click request withdrawal. And then on our end, on the agency site, we would actually go in and approve or deny that withdrawal. So in this case, we'll say the stack height is actually 25 feet. So we don't need the permit application. And we'll click with request for withdrawal. And then it'll ask us, are you sure you want to withdraw the submittal? And we'll click OK. And so that'll send a request to us, letting us know that you want to withdraw this, per, uh, this uh, permit application, and we can go in and, and make those changes. If you're working with an engineer at this point, I would recommend contacting the engineer directly via email or, or phone, and just letting them know that you're going to request the, uh, to withdraw the application, and they can work with you. OK. So John, you wanna do you wanna talk about requesting a determination? Yes. <clears throat> yes, Daniel, I'll do that. Okay. So let me share my screen here. Okay. Chat and we can, you know, handle those questions when we get to the end uh, of today. And if there's something that comes up, we're going to have a, a, a series of small presentations here. But if something comes up right after one of them, just just let us know and we'll um, get back to you right away. Um, the next thing I'm going to show you is how to make a determination request. Uh, the question is, in your mind might be, well, when would you do this? OK, a determination request is something where you have a question about maybe a regulation or an exemption and you want to get a formal written uh, determination made about this. Um, so we actually do a fair number of these. For uh, minor sources, there's no uh, fee for determination, but for a major source, there is um, a, a fee 
uh, just to, uh, because of to account for our time. So the way to make a determination request, it's it's basically the same. You would start uh, a new submittal. Okay, so you'd come hit, hit that, and then you would find that um, application type um, uh, on your in your easier account. So here it's construction determination. I actually think I have started one of these. So let me show you. Let's go to that one. So I'm going to edit one that I've already started. And yeah, it's this one right here, uh, construction determination. So I'm going to uh, click on the edit application icon. And it's a fairly straightforward uh, process. Um, there's only uh, two or three uh, forms in Easy Air that you have to go through. The first one is the facility information. So I'm not, you know, this I pre-filled all this, but this is the same as what what I showed you when we were doing the standard uh, application. So we've got that all filled out. So we'll go to the next form, and this is actually the whole uh, determination request. It's just a big box where you can type um, whatever you want to type uh, about what your question is. And then um, you're also given um, this ability to uh, attach things. So, you know, a lot of times there may be like some calculations that you want us to review. Um, so we would just say, you know, please review the attached calculations for, you know, EU. 38, 35, um, we plan to use the small unit exemption. And you just want, you know, us to review it, um, give you basically the okay in writing that we have reviewed it and everything's checked out. Um, that exemption doesn't require that, but sometimes we get requests, formal requests to do that. So again, um, a lot of questions can be answered over the phone, but if you want to get something really um, definitive in writing, uh, especially when it involves like a federal uh, regulation, complicated, maybe you're not quite sure if it applies to you or not. Um, this is a good option, I think. So we just type in what our um, uh, request is. If we're going to have an attachment, we would click on that. Uh, the, the other question, last question is, did somebody from the Air Quality Bureau help you? You know, in fact, if somebody, if we'd been talking to somebody, you would just find their name from the drop down, and then um, that might be helpful for us if we're trying to figure out something and maybe that other person, you know, already knows the answer. So we would just do that. Again, there's uh, the AF form. There's none for a, a minor source. For the major sources, there would be that form that I showed you. So we're basically done with that. And then uh, here's where we can add our attachments. Um, and, you know, we would just attach as much as we want um, using this. Here, it looks like everything is optional, so I really don't have to do anything. The validation step should go through, and then we're just going to uh, finish off. We, we still have to go through, you know, the submission step. So anytime you're working in Easy Air, you know, either a permit application or determination request, you have to do that. We'll submit. And there won't be any payment here. So we get that error message again. But there is no, there's no payment um, for the minor sources. But for the major sources, there would be. Um, and you can pay again by check or the online. So that's, um, and then we would find it again, like, Daniel said we would probably find it here. Not quite, but okay. I don't want to spend a lot of time on determinations, but I, I think that's fairly self-explanatory, but I just wanted to explain a little bit what that was all about. Um, and then the next thing I want to show you is a little bit uh, more, more involved, and that is applying for a construction permit using one of the permit templates. So again, when we go back to the new submittal, just review what they are. Um, there's five of them, aggregate processing plant, 
bulk gasoline plant, group two, grain, or, excuse me, concrete batch plant, uh, group two grain elevator, and the hot mix asphalt plant. Now, th these are different. These are, these are permits that you're applying for, but they're different uh, than getting a construction, a standard construction permit. Typically, these permit templates apply to an entire facility. And um, there are conditions built into the application that you have to agree to as you're applying. So if you're going to use one of these, and there's advantages to using these. For one thing, they, they're not as expensive. Um, they're easier for everybody to, there's no calculations involved. So there, it's easier application process. It's easier for us to process quicker. Um, so there are a lot of advantages to it. But make sure, uh, if you're using these, that you can meet all the eligibility requirements, because the last thing you want to do is find out that you have one of these and you're not uh, complying with it. So to do it, we'll just pick the aggregate processing plant uh, template as an example. Okay, so I'm going to start an application there. you're eligible, okay? So um, again, I advise you be careful with these, take your time reading through it, make sure you're eligible. But if you are eligible, there, there, there's a lot of pros to, to having one of these. So here we have to read that and then we have to um, indicate that we've read the statement and then we can move on to the next uh, form. Again, if we, if we look over at the wizard here, we want to make sure we follow um, the steps in order, even with the templates. Um, that's an important thing to do. Okay, we get to our contact information. We're going to fill that out the same way as we showed you earlier. Um, this equipment is not portable. This is going to be for a stationary plant. I'm sorry, it is portable. So we'd have to fill in like the first um, staging area. So we're just going to say it's the same as the facility address. Uh, a lot of these plants are portable. There, there are some that are stationary. But if it's a portable plant, you want to indicate that. Okay, now we have um, a series of screens where we are told what the potential regulations are that apply to the plant. So we have to be aware of what our limits are. So this is from the federal uh, subpart triple O rule. So we'd wanna make sure we uh, have read through all this. Every template is gonna be different. So, you know, concrete batch plant will have a different set of requirements, hot mix asphalt. Will have its own requirements, but they're all kind of following this pattern where we have to do a lot of reading to make sure we're eligible before we kind of commit to this. And if we find out we can't uh, comply, then we don't want to use the template. All right, so here's some more um, things, federal rule applicability stuff. So got to make sure we read all that. We get into some stack height requirements here. Uh, there's conditions that we have to meet, so we have to make sure that we're going to meet with that, some operating limits, uh, setback requirements. Um, so you'd really want to make sure that you've read all this and can agree to it. And then finally, the best management practices. So all these templates are similar in that regard. Now, we do have to enter in a list of equipment. And... Um, you can attach uh, a spreadsheet with the, the equipment list, but you have to add at least one uh, row on this form or it will um, not be considered a complete application. So what you're going to do is click uh, add new, and then you're going to just add information about the equipment. So we have a crusher. Um, it's a Jayco and it's model 100. You know, 100, and then associated control equipment, water, spray bar, and then the construction date. Okay. So we would save that. 
And now we would want to add um, the other equipment and you want to do a good job adding your equipment. So you want to add every piece of equipment that's covered by this permit. So it'd be crushers, screeners, conveyor belts, you know, everything at, you know, if you had a, an engine that was used to power it, um, you'd want to include that also. Again, you can use the copy equipment feature. So to do that, you would click on this um, way to the left here, uh, click that, and then you would copy. And then you could just update. Let's say you had a second crusher. So you're going to call that uh, equipment, you know, or let's say that's your, your company ID for the second crusher is 200, not 100. You would copy it and, um, you know, you could, you could just start using that uh, copy feature. Um, so I think, uh, that's what I want to show there. Now the, the, then the last form is the GHG, which again is similar to, uh, what we showed on the standard application. If the, if there are no greenhouse gases emitted, you would check the box, uh, for these plants. If you have an engine, there will be greenhouse gas emissions. So you'd have to estimate that and include it. So for the sake of just finishing this, I will just say no, and we will go on to the next. And then attachment, here's where you can attach your equipment list. The validation step is the same. And then the payment. And the other thing you'll notice is the payment for the templates is a flat fee of $100. So that is another pro, and I will just pay by check. And then we will go through this. Um, steps here in the submission okay so we get that error message again but that's um that's basically how you would do it so permit templates uh very streamlined application but the important thing is to make sure that the facility or the plant that you're getting the permit for is eligible. That would be my big um, recommendation. Okay, so I will stop sharing. And turn it back to Daniel. Thanks, John. Okay, so now we're gonna go into uh, sending back applications or amending applications. So one of the functions of Iowa Easy Air, one of the, the really cool functions here is the fact that you can modify an application after you've submitted it. So what I've done um, while John was, was going through those two, two agenda items there is I actually looked at that submittal that um that we submitted and requested to withdraw the application i denied that withdrawal request and i actually sent back the application so let's say i was working with uh with a user and they said well actually it's not 25 feet it's 35 feet so we actually do need the 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 application we just need to change the the value from 50 to 35 in the application so I denied the withdrawal request, and then I sent back the application. So once an application has been sent back, you're not going to see it in this track submissions section. It becomes a pending submittal again, and it's in a special project status or submittal status of um, an amendment. Uh, so when you go to edit pending submittals, you'll see all the submittals that you're working on, including the ones highlighted in red, which are the ones that have been sent back for amendment. So these are active projects um, that we're working on. And uh, they're, they're ones that you need to resubmit at this point. So in order to modify a, an application that's an amendment, you would click this edit button. And as you can notice, it, as you can see here, any pending submittal that hasn't been submitted, you can actually go ahead and delete that submittal using the uh, delete button. But for an application that's in amendment, that's one where we need additional information, uh, you cannot delete that application. So we're gonna click this edit application button and open up 
the application. It's going to show any comments here that the permit engineer has entered and then the date that they sent it back. And so you just click amend and go through. You can, you can click the next button, use that to go through the application. Everything's already filled in the same way that, that it was when you submitted the application. Or you can skip to the page that you're looking for. So in this case, we're looking for the mission point and we said, okay, the mission, the, the stack height is not 50 feet, it's actually 35 feet. You would click save and then you could go through the rest of the application and submit it once again. And so we're gonna, we won't go through the, the submission step again, but it's exactly the same. And after you submit it, you're gonna see it in that track submissions section of the website once again. So if you, if you ever need to amend something in an application or make changes to the application forms in any way, just let the permit engineer know and they can send the application back to you as long as the permit hasn't been issued at that point. Um, so it's a little bit different than the withdrawal request uh, process where the withdrawal request, you would request that within the system. If you need us to send back an application, just let us know and we'll send it back. Uh, now I wanna talk about the startup reports. So within Iowa Easy Air, every time you issue a permit or we issue permits within the system, it's gonna create two report requirements. It's gonna create a start of construction report requirement and a start of operation report requirement. So these are two notification reports that we've required for permits for a long time. And after Iowa Easy Air went live, uh, we actually made them required for every single type of permit modification um, since that's in part because the system uh, requires those reports for every permit issued um, in the system. So if there is a physical change in the project, you would, um, or if it's a new permit, if it's a new construction or something that's gonna happen after the permit's been issued, then you would enter the date of um, the date you begin begin construction, and then the date you begin operation. So with those changes, if it's a permit modification where there's no change or the change has already happened, you would just enter in the date that the permit was. So if there's a minor change you're making, in our case, the project that we're working on now with the stack height difference the stack height has already been changed. So when we issue that modified permit, if there are no other changes, we would just enter the permit issuance date as the start of construction and the start of operation date. So your dashboard is gonna list the upcoming submittal obligations and it's gonna give you a status here. So if it's overdue, it means that you're past the, um, the period, um, the due date, so our permits, and correct me if I'm wrong, John, but our permits have um, requirements that you begin construction uh, within eight, 18 months of the uh, permit issuance date. And then you're required to begin operation within 36 months of the permit issuance date. So these due dates are based on that, uh, that specific requirement. So in this case, this permit was issued in on March 15th, 2021. So 18 months later, so September 15th, 2022, you were required to begin construction by that point. If you have um, reports that have been submitted, you'll see those there. And then if you have reports that are pending where you've actually gone in to make changes, but you haven't submitted the, the report, that will show up there as well. So we can go in here and access the reports and submit the reports. Or alternatively, we can go to edit pending submittals and find those reports as well. Or sorry, start, start a new submittal. So edit pending submittal will show the reports if you update the category there. Uh, so in order to access the reports in the system when you're creating a new report, or if you're looking at pending reports, uh, you either need to go to up here to the category uh, field and select all, or report. 
So currently it's just showing the application types for permits. So you see all the application types here for uh, air construction permit applications and the precision and the Title V application types here. If you select all and you click search, you'll see the startup reports show up there on that list as well. Alternatively, you can just select report and click search. And you're just gonna see the startup submittals there. Okay, so when you click start here, you're gonna get a list. You're gonna have your facility list here. If your account is associated with a lot of facilities and you can select uh, the facility, you can select the permit number if it's listed there, or you can select um, monitoring period. You can search by a lot of different fields here. The most straightforward way to search is to just select your facility name. And then you can see all of the reports that are um, that are due here. So down here we have a new report that hasn't been started yet that we haven't started working on or uh, submitted. So these are ones that are already open and they'll be under pending submittals. Uh, this is a brand new started construction report for this permit here specifically. So in order to create the new submittal, you would click this create button here. And within the system, <clears throat> I don't know how many of you are familiar with um, the startup reports before Iowa Easy Air. So before Iowa Easy Air, you were required to submit paper forms where you would fill out all this information, the facility name, the permit number, EPID, essentially all of the information that we have already pre-filled here um, in this report submittal. So the only thing you have to do in Iowa Easy Air is just select the start of construction or start of operation start date. And so we'll just put in a date here and say we started on February 2nd. Everything else is already filled in. And then you would click next, click next again, and then click submit. And that's all you have to do. So again, we're getting that token error with the slice notification, but that's all you would have to do for a submittal to submit that report. <clears throat> So here again, you would change the category to report to track that submittal if you want to track it. And you can see that the report has been uh, received for this permit number here. One of the changes we made last year with the startup reports is that if you're a preparer or a consultant in the system associated with the facility, as long as you're associated with the startup reports as well as the other um, submittal types, you can actually submit those reports directly. So you don't need to be uh, an RO for construction permitting to submit the reports now in this system. So as long as you're a preparer associated with the facility, you can go in and so submit those startup reports. So the other way you can access those startup reports is you go to the dashboard here, you, you see your EPID or your permit number and you say, okay, I know when we started this, um, <clears throat> the start of construction. So when we started constructing or beginning construction on this point and you select the date. So here we already started working on it, but we'll say October 16th. So let's say October 15th, <clears throat> click next, click next. And so for this facility, if you run into a situation like this where you're a preparer and it says notify owner, that means that your account is not allowed to submit the startup reports. And if you run into a situation like this, contact us because the RO has to give you approval to prepare and submit the startup reports. So if you're working with an RO and you're a consultant or uh, you're a preparer and you don't have the right account privileges, just let us know and we'll, we'll help you out. 
And so here, <clears throat> in this case, since I'm not allowed to submit the uh, startup reports for this facility because of my account association with, uh, with ADM Clinton here, uh, it just notifies the RO that there's a report ready for their review. Okay, so, uh, <clears throat> so those are startup um, reports in the system, sort of construction, sort of operation. Uh, we think that they're a lot easier than submitting the, uh, the paper forms because you just have to locate <clears throat> the permit uh, or the EPID and just start the report and select the date and submit. So it should be pretty straightforward. You don't have to fill out entire forms. Um, you can do a lot of them at one time if you had a project that had a lot of permit modifications. Um, so it should be pretty straightforward to do those, um, those reports in Iowa easier. So next I wanna talk about um, requesting a rescission to a permit. <clears throat> So as I mentioned before, this action button previously had rescission as an option. Uh, we've removed that due to certain issues with submittals. So in order to request a rescission for a permit, you would go to start a new submittal. And there's a separate module here for rescissions. So uh, you'd click start under the rescission module. <clears throat> you rescind equipment, um, you're, you're rescinding the permit. You're not necessarily removing the equipment from the equipment tables in the system. So there's a separate form that you would fill out to remove that equipment. And it's it, essentially, we have to set the equipment to inactive in the system. And there's a link to that form within the rescission module so you can easily access it and fill it out as you're doing your permit rescission. Because sometimes, even if you're rescinding a permit, that equipment might vent to another stack or you might move equipment within the facility. In a lot of cases, when you're rescinding a permit, it doesn't necessarily mean that the equipment itself is um, being removed from the site. So that's why we have a separate process for actually removing that equipment from the equipment list within Iowa Easier and setting them to inactive. <clears throat> so here we're gonna select our facility, Iowa Easier. Uh, you would fill out your information, your contact information here, where the rescission letter should be mailed to. And then you get to the actual rescission process here. So when you're submitting a rescission, you can submit the request uh, for rescission as a letter as an attachment, or you can just submit the state your reasons here within the actual application. So we would prefer if you actually use the, the text box here to just describe, you know, removing um, an emission point from the facility, all associated equipment will be removed offsite. So we'll just make a note there. And you can go in here and select your actual EPID that's associated with the permit. And here we'll just put, select this uh, emission point ID, and then you can select your permit number. If it's a prevention of significant deterioration or a PSD permit, you would check this box. So for PSD permits, we actually put those out, uh, PSD permit rescissions, we actually put those out on public notice. So if it's a PSD permit, just make sure you select this box here. So this is the main, um, this is the main part of the rescission module. Like I mentioned, this only rescinds the permit. It doesn't remove any of the EPs or uh, control equipment devices or mission units associated with this permit from the actual equipment list. 
in order to remove or deactivate that equipment, we have something called a facility equipment deactivation form. And within the rescission module, uh, you can click this link to open up that form. Alternatively, you can go to our eAir Services website and find that same form there. So if you click this link, it'll open up the facility equipment deactivation form where you can put in your facility name, your facility number, and then you can list out all of the emission points, control equipment devices, and emission units that are going to be removed from the site or where their operation is going to stop. And then you fill out the contact information, plant number, and these, these um, instructions should give, um, it, it's pretty straightforward to fill out the form, but these instructions can give more details on how to fill out each specific uh, field here. And then we did add an additional, um, an additional uh, couple of tables here at the very end, in case there are more uh, units and points that you wanna remove from the site or set to inactive in the system. Okay, so we'll go back to Iowa Easy Air. And we'll go back to our uh, submittal here, precision submittal. Just really quickly select removing equipment. Okay, so uh, the next step here in the application is the attachments. And here you can add in your rescission letter if you wanted to submit that um, instead of using the text box there. Uh, if you select that you do want to set um, send it in as an attachment, it'll become required. And then we also have uh, the uh, deactivation form here in case you want to add that to the application. Once again, validation page, and then you can go through and submit the request. Okay. All right, so the last item that I wanna talk about here before we get into any questions is how to search for permits using the um, public inquiry page. So within Iowa Easier, if, you, if we go back to this login page, there's a link to the public inquiry portal and it's right here on the main page, um, kind of highlighted in, in yellow. And if you select that, um, if you go to the public inquiry page, you can go in here and see all of the submitted applications uh, um, that we're currently working on. So we have three tabs here. The first one is the active applications. These are the applications that we're working on. You can go through and um, filter them by type, uh, or sorry, the submittal status. You can filter them by type of application. You can search by facility name, by project number or EIQ number. Uh, and then just once you, you click on this application, it will show you the details um, of that application. So for this aggregate processing plant that John, um, John just worked on, you know, we can look at the application forms here. And they're really small um, here. We'll zoom in a little bit, but you can see the application forms for that submittal. Uh, you can see exactly who submitted it. You can see um, all the information here for that for that form for that application, and then if they submitted any attachments with the application. So the second tab here. Here's the final permit tab. Here you can actually go in and search for any permit that's been issued in the system. We also have links to historical permits, most of our historical permits here. So we'll search for a permit um, that was issued to the Iowa Easy Air test site. site. So here we can see that 23A01. Um, and we can download the PDF version of that final permit document here um, by clicking this link. 
if it's a historical permit, you're going to see the link uh, to the historical permit here on the um, in this right hand column. And those are permits that um, that we did we didn't issue in Iowa easier. So it's just going to link you back to um, the construction permit search uh, version of the, the permit. Okay, so the third and final tab we have here is the public notice tab. So here we have all the projects out for public notice. Uh, so on the test site, it's not too many, um, but it will show the Title V and construction permit public notice. So for construction permitting, you can go in, uh, you can see the project number, the uh, public comment period, when the public comment period is supposed to end. You can see any public comment documents that we upload. So for this one, we just have the application here, but um, you can, you'll, you'll see fact sheets here, technical um, information, uh, any uh, additional application information that was submitted. So everything that we, we need uh, to, to put a project out for public notice is gonna be here within Iowa Easy Air in this public inquiry page. And then you also have the application forms here directly pulled from the system. Okay, so that's the public inquiry page. And um, we, we have gotten questions in the past about public inquiry page and we just wanna state, so anything you enter into the system uh, we don't have access to and the public doesn't have access to until you actually submit the application. So if you're working on a, a submittal and you're making, um, you know, you're putting in values as kind of placeholders and you're not sure what the final values will be, you can work on that. And it's not going to show up in these under this active applications tab or anywhere else until you actually submit the application. And as soon as you submit the application, similar to how our other you know, requests for public information would work, that application is now part of the public record and can be accessed by anyone. Um, so this is before Iowa Easier, if anyone came in and uh, asked us about any of the applications that we were currently working on, we would take the, the application documents, everything that's been submitted, and then um, they would be able to access that since it's a public record at that point. So John, I don't know if we, is that, is there anything else that we should talk about from looking at construction permitting specifically? I got, I got one thing, Daniel, that kind of follows along what you've been talking about here that's come up recently. Um, remember, whatever you submit to us in Easy Air is part of the public record. So if you have information that you want to uh, somehow, that information you believe should be held confidential, you do not enter that information then into Iowa Easy Air. You have, we have a procedure yep. on how to handle that. You have to do it. There's a form you'd have to fill out and you'd be submitting a paper, things in paper, both the, um, the unredacted and then the redacted form. So you, you just should be aware of that, that there's no confidential uh, ability uh, in Easy Air. And uh, I just want to bring that up because that has come up uh, recently. And yeah, so. Yeah, go so, ahead. Yeah, so that confidential form is on our um, on our website here. And you would just follow the instructions on the form. Um, and like John mentioned, anything you want to claim confidentiality over um, doesn't necessarily mean that we'll approve the confidentiality request, but anything you want to claim confidentiality over uh, in an application, make sure you follow the instructions in this form uh, and don't submit that information in Iowa easier. And that's available on our um, air quality website here. Mm -hmm. So construction permits, construction permitting materials, and then under general guidance. That was the only other thing I could think of. Okay. So uh, we have several minutes here. 
<clears throat> at the end of our training where we can um, take any questions that anyone has or they may have um, kind of been waiting to ask uh, anything at all about the system, about um, submitting air construction permit applications or reports or requesting rescission, anything that we've discussed so far where if you want some more clarification or you have any, any uh, questions, um, just let us know. <clears throat>